Hey, Bastish Bia for 64K and welcome to another episode of Top 10s. Welcome to 64K. Hosted by Bastish B. And in this episode, I've rounded up my top 100 favorite New Wave Commodore 64 games. And New Wave is a term I like to use to describe newer Commodore 64 releases. That means anything released from the year 2000 right up to the end of 2023 as of making this video. And the rules for this video are pretty simple. It's open to all new original Commodore 64 games made for the system. It also includes games that are updates of classic games from the 80s and 90s. And it also includes games that are ports from other systems that are now new to the Commodore 64. And without further delay, let's get this top 100 underway. Number 100. Man Cave was released through Megastyle and is only coder Chris Stanley's second game he's ever made, which is most impressive, as this game improves on his first fun release, The Exploding Fish, tenfold, and that was also released through Megastyle in 2018. In this wacky, fun little arcade-style game, your goal is to gather up all your old stash of adult magazines that have been littered all over the house by your bratty kids, getting them and stashing them before the wife finds them. As you can see, the gameplay is very reminiscent of those old arcade titles and has you harding and dodging your way to victory in a very fast paced style. And just like those old games, every couple of levels you also have a bonus stage to break up the gameplay repetition a bit. The game even sports trophies or achievements, which must be one of the first C64 games to do so, which is a very interesting addition. The graphics are very nice and detailed, with funny intermission animations as well. The music is superb by Roy Wedding, who does some Sid interpretations of classic 80s songs, and they all sound pretty brilliant. As a bonus, if you buy the game through Megastar, you also get a fun little arcade single screen game called Doxter's Digger as a bonus. This is a great little game by Chris and I look forward to see what his next C64 game is going to be. Number 99 Super Gotron is the first game here made for RGCD's 16 kilobyte cartridge competition and is just a whole lot of fun in such a small package. It was coded by Mika Misfit Karanen who also did Cheese and Onion which is a very impressive Commodore VIC-20 platform game. Super Gotron is a bit of a mix of Space Invaders with a little bit of Arkanoi thrown in for good measure. It has very well designed and unique stages, extremely addictive gameplay, some nice high res graphics and a pretty good music score up a fun game that anyone can pick up and play and have a really good time with. You can also pick up a physical cartridge version of this game from The Future Is 8-Bit, a very cool online store that has a bunch of other excellent cheap C64 physical games and peripherals, so definitely check those guys out. Number 98 Space Station 23 was released on the Commodore 64 in April of 2023 by Vector 5 Games. This is a fast paced action maze adventure game where you as Joe Phoenix, who seems to be the same character from one of Vector 5's previous C64 games called Jungle Joe. And if you've never played that, it's a great puzzle style game that's totally worth looking at. In this game, you have to fly off to a space station that's been hit by an asteroid and attempt to repair it. And of course, wipe out all those pesky aliens who haven't fested it as well. It's a bit like Sega's Alien Syndrome, just with a bigger emphasis on puzzle solving. The game has both indoor and outdoor environments. When you first land, you have to make your way to the station on foot, but due to the planet's surface being so hot, you have to keep filling up on coolant to keep your suit cool. The main objective here is to collect everything, such as ammo for your gun, health, and different resources which are all needed to escape a level. And you can see how many you need on the right hand side on the HUD. The key cards are used for doors and finding OS discs for computers reactivates them to help bring the station back to life. Aliens are all over the place to be blasted, but make sure you take out their gauntlet style generators first, otherwise they'll just keep on respawning. Ammo is also pretty limited, so you need to relax on that run and gun mentality and make every bullet count Resident Evil style. Obstacles are all over the place, of course, to stop your progress. There's massive laser fields, debris, etc, etc. Big bombs can be used to blast parts 
past certain sections. You can use transporters to access new parts of a level. And of course backtracking is needed as you make your way around solving various puzzles. Overall you have to progress through 10 stages of the station including indoor and outdoor locations with 240 rooms in total to explore. This is a really fun well made game that literally just came out of nowhere. I didn't know anything about it. It has good simple graphics, easy to understand gameplay that's very rewarding and a really great SID opening tune. Best part is it's available for free or name your own price from Vector 5 Games and works on a real C64 as well as the Mini and Maxi. And I'll leave links in the video description for you to pick it up. Another solid well made C64 modern entry. Number 97 my Life was released by Cytronic Software in 2016 on the C64. This game was made by the team of Trevor Story on graphics, Akim Volkers on coding and Soul Cross on music. And if that team sounds familiar, they also made The Darkness, Age of Heroes and tons of other fantastic C64 games that have come out over the last few years. The story for the game is you play Eugene and he lives a pretty mundane life. Your goal is to survive one week in his miserable life and make it to the weekend. Each day has you trying to get to work with each day progressively getting harder and harder. The gameplay is exactly the same as Maki with you needing to stamp on letters and make up words or phrases to escape each level while avoiding all manner of death like weird vacuum cleaners and mailmen and all other mental things trying to kill you. The game features some really great high res graphics that look extremely good and the music is also pretty stomping and catchy although not as memorable as Maki's but they did have the Beatles advantage so take that with a great I had a ton of fun messing around with this game. It's just a cool, fun arcade style romp that you can slap on for 10 minutes or so at a time between breaks from that latest epic 60 hour RPG that you're attempting to finish by the weekend. Number 96. GP Cars was released in March of 2023 on the C64 by LHS. The game's a racer in the top-down micro-machine style, or more accurately, it looks and feels a lot like the C64 conversion of the Sega arcade game Hot Rod. The modern Commodore gaming scene doesn't put out a lot of racing games. Besides the recent Muddy Racers, it's been pretty few and far between, so this is always a treat. Taking its style from Hot Rod, meaning it's much more of a slower-paced affair where pinpoint driving is the focus over speed. In the game, Game which features 25 tracks in total spread across a nice big variety of styles. You have to either beat the clock or the opponents to move on and unlock more of the tracks. You'll also gain access to a ton of different vehicle styles, everything from dune buggies to high-end sports cars. And the tracks themselves are pretty varied with obstacles to avoid and hazards such as ice patches which leads to a slight loss of control. My favorite part about some of these tracks though is when there is multiple paths to take. They all end up looping back to the main track but finally in the fastest easiest route adds a good bit of replayability to the mix. The tracks themselves ramp up in difficulty with some of the later ones almost feeling like a World War II minefield more than a racetrack and it can get pretty difficult. The cars are equipped with a small turbo boost and do vary in speed, not by much as this is more about precision driving overall and not pedal to the metal antics. The presentation overall is really high, nice detailed cars and the track graphics are pretty varied making it feel like true progress is happening from track to track. The music and sound effects are top notch with tons of great tunes in the menus as well as in-game to get the blood pumping, or provided by Necropolo who also worked on the tunes for the excellent 2016 release Hessian by Covert Bit Ops. And the best part is this game is also available for free and I'll leave links in the description to the download of the game which is compatible with the mini, maxi and of course original hardware. Overall this is just a great quality single player racer that we don't get to see too much of these days on the C64. Number 95 Showdown was released in late 2020 by Badger Punch Games on the Commodore 64. It's a new take on the classic showdown genre of games that started in the arcades in the 1970s. The game is a one or two player versus affair just like Boot Hill or Outlaw, where you gun it out against your opponent, real or computer, with the first to five wins taking the game. When you first load it up, you greet it with a fantastic little SID tune, which thumps away and boosts the atmosphere of the game tremendously. Just like Boot Hill, you can hide behind debris. You the wagon as cover, but watch out for those boxes of TNT, they can either aid you by blowing up your foe or be your ultimate undoing. The bullets can be curved slightly just like Boot Hill and you'll want to make sure you reload before jumping out for your kill shot. 
Again, this is a fun little distraction for a few minutes, and nothing more in single player. But in two player versus, it's an absolute blast to play. So if this is how you're gonna play it, then download this right now. The graphics are very nice and detailed with great animation and the music is really cool as well. My only gripe is that I wish there was just some variety in the stages. Why not throw in some classic western themes like the town square showdown? the abandoned gold mine or a shootout in an old graveyard. All fun locales that would have made the single player at least more interesting. I like this game, it's simple and fun, but would only recommend it if you plan on playing it in two player mode. Single player is just a little bit too basic. If it had a few more options that would have been really cool, but seeing as it's only one dollar, it's kind of worth buying anyway and supporting the C64 programming community at the same time. It's both PAL and NTSC compatible and works on original and C64 Maxi and Mini. So why not check it out? Number 94 Robot Jet Action was released in January 2022 on the Commodore 64 by Thomas Milnick. This game kind of came out of nowhere for me. I wasn't even aware of its existence, which is amazing to me to think that there are so many Commodore 64 games currently being made, I can't even keep track of them all. Anyway, Robot Jet Action can best be described as the bomb jack game the C64 always deserved. If you were disappointed in the 80s with Elite's conversion of that game, then this I feel finally fills that gap. The story is really a original as well, with a bunch of robots invading random gaming worlds and stealing all the loot you usually collect, like stars, coins, diamonds, etc. And it's up to you as the robot with the jet action to get all the stuff back, so the games can go on as usual. The game also kicks off with this really cool awesome little intro sequence that shows everything I've just described. A nice feature is being able to choose which of the five gaming worlds you want to visit. This non-linear approach makes checking out all the areas inviting, as opposed to maybe not being able to see half of them because the difficulty is too high. But I'm not going to sugarcoat it. The difficulty is pretty steep. You are literally going to die a lot. Just like Bomb Jack, you use one button to boost and you can multiply that by the amount of fuel in your jetpack. Basically collect all the shinies and avoid the enemies and level traps. Each of the game's worlds is also an homage to other games. So far I've noticed Mayhem and Monsterland. Flashback and even Jet Set Willy. It's cool to see this kind of easter eggs, especially for us veteran gamers to enjoy. Overall there are 35 levels of action all spread out over the 5 worlds and also includes big boss style end stages. The graphics are very impressive with their excellent high res look and wonderful use of color, all done by Thomas himself as he served as coder, graphics artist and concept artist for the entire game. The music is also absolutely rocking as well by Camille Nikowski and fits the game perfectly. I only wish there were more tunes, but that's just me being greedy as I'm a bit of a Sid junkie. Despite the game needing some trial and error, especially noticing those little level traps that spark you all the time and the higher difficulty, it's still a very well made and great experience to try out. The game is also available for free, so why not? And I'll leave links in the video description for you to check it out as it works on all modern emulators, mini and maxi and the original Breadbox. Number 93 Burks 4 is a great shoot 'em up style game with gameplay similar to old arcade classics like Berserk or Robotron. It was a digital monastery release which is the game development division of Hokuto Force, the C64 cracking and demo group. John Williams, no not that John Williams, was an old school coder for the group who did games on the C64 like Shadow Dancer and First Samurai back in the day. Gameplay involves traversing these mazes looking for keys all the while blasting robots and enemies. It's pretty fast paced shooter action with large doses of strategy if you really want to get anywhere. Nice bright and colorful graphics with cool music. Although the sound effects does get a little bit annoying after a while, it's still an excellent throwback to 80s style arcade games or retro computer games and is another C64 hidden gem for sure. Number 92 the original Rockstar Ate My Hamster was released in 1988 by Codemasters. It was a rock band management game where you had to form a band, manage them to the peak of fame, go on tour, record hit singles and albums and keep the talent in check. You get an inheritance of 50,000 pounds at the start of the game and that sets in motion all the antics. The goal is to form the band, record an album and earn four gold discs within one year. Failing occurs when musicians leave the band or die, you go bankrupt or just fail to reach the four disc goal. I first played this game on an Amiga as I played it at a guy's house who was selling his entire C64 collection. I went to his place every few weeks whenever I had money and picked up 
Xbox, more C64 games, and he was always playing this relentlessly, which made me end up getting the C64 version for myself. Just like all management games, you constantly have to make choices and spend money. Your funds can be used for things like band practices to improve their skills, go touring to improve their fame, set up publicity stunts that can either go really well or have dire consequences, buy gifts for the wildcard band members to keep them happy, and of course, releasing your record and promotion. It's all the little choices though that are the real fun, like deciding to whether to send a hit squad out to a music bootleg business, or choosing whatever weird director for your latest music video, and so much more. The most unique aspect though is the game's sense of humor, which is something management games are not known for. It's very tongue-in-cheek with over 50 musicians old and new, in the late 80s of course, parodied for you to choose from and have in your band. Obviously with altered names attached, although it's not too subtle and you'll have a lot of chuckles as you make your way through them. And that brings us to the new release on the Commodore 64 called Rockstar 8 My Hamster Millennium, which was released in November 2021. This is an unofficial mod of the original C64 version which adds 50 new rock and pop stars to the roster, including artists from about 2000 to about 2020, which have all been parodied to perfection. The 80 stars are still in there however, as well as 7 more, who were only available from Rockstar Goes Bizarre, a special promo edition which was only available through a competition in partnership with the Sun newspaper, which is parody in the game to no end. The game's original graphics artist Chris Graham also did a bunch of these new portraits himself adding a bit of a legitimate edge to this release. The game is still exactly the same, so everything I mentioned about the Amiga version is still intact. You just get to experience it with a whole modern roster of talent, which is actually pretty fun. And if you're a purist, the old roster is still in there. So if you haven't tried this game before, then this is obviously the ultimate edition to play. And fear not, if management games are not your thing, you should still give it a go. The combination of humor and very easy to get into gameplay makes it a fun experience overall. This version is obviously also available for free and works on NTSC and PAL C64s, Mini, Maxi and there's even a Plus 4 edition. And I'll leave a link to download the game in the video description. So check it out, it's a fun romp through a time when parodies and humor were still allowed without someone getting cancelled. Number 91. Bad Moon Rising was released in early 2021 by Cytronic Software on the Commodore 64. It's a kind of throwback to the multi-gameplay style romps like Raid Over Moscow or anything by Cinemaware, except no strategy this time, it's all pure arcade style action. The story is basically ripped from that cheese-tastic movie Iron Scar, with the Nazis making a secret war base on the moon, and you're as part of a European space team trying to blow the thing all to hell to save mankind. The game features some fun cheesy cutscenes that set up the action with seven different levels overall, each one of them switching up the gameplay to make a really varied gaming experience. The seven levels include a torture screen which depending on how well you do determines how many lives you get at the beginning of the game which is pretty unique, a few horizontal styled scrolling ship levels, a cabal type shooting stage, multiple vertically scrolling shoot em up stages, and even a versus style beat em up section. It is extremely varied with some nice high res graphics and some decent tunes by modern Sid Master Soul Cross. I particularly love the end credits tune. The game was programmed by Stefan Kattenetta, who also did the graphics and I think he did a pretty good job overall. The biggest issue though with this game is its difficulty. It's all over the place. The second level particularly is way too hard and will probably put most people off unfortunately. It does have multiple difficulties though which is pretty helpful. If you can get past that though it's a pretty good game. It works on everything from real C64s to minis and maxis and is NTSC and PAL compatible with physical versions also available from Cytronic. It is overall flawed and uneven but still a quality made title nevertheless. We interrupt our program to bring you this important message. Number 90.
Planet X2 by David Murray which was released in 2017. You may know David from his popular YouTube channel The 8-Bit Guy and he is a designer, coder and graphics programmer of the Sapphire RTS resource management game. The story is you're trying to colonize a new planet for a human population but the aliens have started doing the same. It's a classic RTS or real-time strategy game where the goal is to build up your bases, factories, mine minerals for cash, to build up your military and attack and wipe out the alien bases before they get to you. If you've ever played classics like Command and Conquer or Starcraft, you'll be right at home here. And in terms of look and style, it reminds me a lot of those early SSR strategy games on the C64 in the 80s. RTSs are not a genre I'm very fond of to be quite honest, but this for whatever reason feels very different and much more enjoyable for me. It's jammed with options and features 10 massive maps to tackle with adjustable difficulty which makes it getting into this style of game very easy. I also really like using the keyboard for controls and makes the game move at a really fast pace that could never be replicated with a joystick in this style of game. The combination of mining, building, strategy and running gun type combat make this a very fun game to try out. Like I said before, the graphics have that classic SSR or even Ultima look and the title music is really pretty good with some decent sound effects in game as well. It runs perfectly on the new C64 Maxi as well with the keyboard controls working really well and you can also buy a physical copy from David website the 8 bit number 89 and in 2015 we got a new version of scramble released on the Commodore 64 by Thomas Carr called scramble version 1.4 Wow this is the first thing I said when booting this thing up for the first time. I know the arcade is pretty simplistic in retrospect, but to see such an accurate version of the arcade game on the C64 is just such a pleasure. The attention to detail is brilliant, from the recreation of the menus to the sprites looking exactly like the arcade game. Even the sound is replicated almost to a T. It's crazy good. It also plays really smoothly and is much faster and more responsive than the analog clone. I'm not really sure his reasoning for changing the fuel to oil and your ship therefore having an oil gauge it doesn't really make too much sense to me to make this small change if you're planning to sell this I would understand but it's a free fan made game so why change the hat if anybody has a logical idea about this please leave a comment despite this though it's an almost perfect arcade port that feels looks and sounds almost exactly like the arcade and is a highly recommend play on your Commodore 64 Number 88 in late 2020, we got Neptune Lander Elite on the Commodore 64 by C64 Mark. This is essentially another clone game, but it goes way more than that. By taking the basic gameplay and adding lots of fun addictiveness to the overall experience. Number one is definitely music. I love a game with a good thumping soundtrack. A C64 game especially just feels kind of weird without one, and this game has some rocking tracks. All the basic tropes are in place though. Choose where to land out of three options. If successful, however, you move on to the next level with 40 uniquely designed stages in total to try out and beat. I really like all the fun little additions like the laser guns, massive moving doors, those dodgy EMP traps and various others that make this much more challenging than the previous games. The stages themselves are also designed extremely well and are not merely randomly generated like the original Lunar Lander. Difficulty settings are also available if you find it a bit hard and the cracking group Access has a nice train version if you really bad at it. The best part though is that the game is free or pay what you want, so why not give them a couple of bucks for this cool little game. It is however only PAL compatible in case you're thinking of playing it on original hardware, so just bear that in mind. The excellent graphics, the really nice variety to the stages, optional music or sound effects in game, great controls which again I'd highly recommend keyboard over controller for this game for the best experience and this all amounts to a another excellent clone game which goes beyond the original and is one of the most fun recent C64 games I've played. Check it out. Number 87 Venture was released in the arcades by Exidy in 1981. Exidy themselves were founded near the start of the video arcade scene in 1973 and are probably best remembered for their controversial games such as 76's Death Race and the poor taste that is 1986's Chiller. But between those they put out a very unique arcade dungeon crawler styled affair that resembled an RPG of that era but was way more in tune with gauntlet and arcade style action tropes. Your goal was to raid three different dungeons and steal as much treasure as you can and escape. 
Each level is made up of a bunch of rooms with treasure in each guarded by enemies. The faster you complete the level, the higher your score. You're equipped with bow and arrows to take them out. Some rooms have traps. And there's also an enemy called the Hall Monster that comes out if you take too long. He's basically immortal, so running is your only option. These guys work the same way as Evil Otto from the arcade Berserk, to panic you into dying and therefore insert another coin. It didn't look or play like anything else in the arcades at that time, and had pretty addictive gameplay to despite being able to finish it pretty quickly. It only ended up receiving three ports all in the early 80s, an Atari 2600 version, Intellivision version, and was a launch title for the ColecoVision. And that port is still considered the definitive home edition. In 2022, the C64 finally got a conversion this excellent XD classic, courtesy of Donnie Russell. He is a self-taught C64 programmer, with the Commodore being his first computer. He got his skills started by doing magazine type-in programs, and then went on to read many books on programming and basic. All these skills would later be used to create this excellent version of Venture. The attention to detail here is extremely and I love how he not only captures the looks of the arcade but nails the gameplay spot on with quick fluid gameplay and a multitude of tunes replicating the sounds of the arcades and some of the home conversions. The entire arcade game is here intact for you to play and is such a fun throwback to those early arcade days. Not only has Donnie done an excellent job with this conversion but he has also provided the game for free and on top of that he's made this awesome cassette tape PDF insert as you make your own physical copy version of the game. Like 2021, this year is giving us so many great unconverted arcade games to enjoy on our C64. And again, from myself and I'm sure the entire Commodore community, we thank Donnie and everybody out there that are slaving away making these awesome conversions for all of us to enjoy. Thank you. Number 86. The Lord of Dragonspire was released in December 2019 by Icon on the C64 as part of the Zap 64 2020 annual stretch goal collaboration. It received a general physical and digital release though in the first quarter of 2020 to the masses. Much like Master of Magic, Dragonspire is soaking in high fantasy tropes, with the basics of the story involving you needing to get to the Dragonspire Tower and fight your way up to the top and kill the Demon Lord who's taken up residence and is using the Tower's dark magic to bring back all the nasty creatures of old. As you can no doubt see, Dragonspire wears its inspiration proud, with the game mimicking the look, feel and style of said classic to a T. The play area though is much larger, giving you a bit less of a claustrophobic feel as magic, but besides that they are extremely similar. The game has all the exploration elements that make this style of game so addictive, which is what's around that next corner and do I risk searching it even though I've got no more food left, it's that kind of feel which makes it so enjoyable. As you can also see, creatures are visible on screen so you can avoid combat if you like, just like Master of Magic. The one big difference is in these games is the difficulty Difficulty, with Dragonspire being pretty tough initially, until you level up a bit, you can down almost any encounter and healing food is pretty scarce, so getting into the game does require skill but also a large dose of luck, especially in the early beginnings. Besides this grub though, it's well made with some nice graphics and a truly epic SID soundtrack that's more than 10 minutes long by the great Jason Page, that is a fitting fantasy tribute to Hubbard's classic. We also got Stuart Collier on coding duties, as well as Trevor Story on game design and art. These guys have all been involved in one way or another with some of the best software released on the C64 over the last 10 years. Also as with a bunch of Archon's recent releases you also get a cool music demo as well that's a fun way to listen to the soundtrack uninterrupted. Like I mentioned earlier the game is available in digital and physical form from Sartronic Software on the C64 and I'll leave a link in the description to the game. Overall it's really enjoyable which like Master combines light RPG elements and turn based action into a satisfying fantasy exploration game that's definitely worth your time. Number 85 now let's jump over to the unofficial sequel, Bruce Lee 2, which was released on the C64 by Jonas Holton, based on the unofficial 2013 game by Bruno Marcos, which was released on Windows and Linux. Both versions are fan-made. It took Jonas a year to convert the game to the original C64, and the results are quite spectacular. Bear in mind that most of it is not based on the original source code, and almost everything had to be built from scratch. I'll leave a link to the description to his original making of vlog. It's an interesting read. Now back to the game. 
again. The story this time has Bruce's sister being kidnapped by some crazy low pan looking wizard dude and Bruce has to rescue her from his deadly castle. Henchmen from around the world have been born in this time including Kareem Abdul-Jabbar from The Game of Death and Chuck Norris from Way of the Dragon, both classic Bruce Lee movies. The game plays out very much like the original. You progress by collecting lanterns which open gates and secret passages, all the while you're getting attacked by the aforementioned foes and a crazy samurai with a bonus appearance by the original ninja as well. Avoiding sparks, laser floors and landmines is also back. The first thing you're going to notice when you start playing is that the pace is a bit faster than the original. Bruce can also swim now and the ducking animation looks like he's actually ducking and didn't just get run over by a semi truck. The biggest change though is the difficulty. It's damn tough. So much so that they had to release an updated version with an easy mode. Most of the difficulty revolved around pinpoint accurate jumping which is a real pain. But the easy mode rectifies most of that and makes the whole game a lot more fun to play. Graphics and sound are almost a carbon copy of the original so you feel right at home straight away after starting it up. And I think they did an excellent job creating a sequel to a game which unfortunately never got one. It's well worth your time. Number 84 Subhunter was published by Cytronic and was developed by The New Dimension. This game is a relentless, fast-paced, arcade-style shooter with various mini-games thrown in for good measure. A bunch of dodgy experiments gone wrong have mutated the aquatic creatures of the sea. You have to take your trusty submarine and blast your way through levels and rescue swimmers trapped out in the ocean. To progress through each level, all you have to do is collect a set number of swimmers. The game switches from side-scrolling shooter levels with cool parallax scrolling effects to single screen type rescue efforts where you either depth charge in a bunch of mutant fish so the swimmers can make their way back to shore or you have to submerge to the bottom of the ocean picking up stranded divers. You've got to keep track of your oxygen on each level which is basically a timer and extra lives can be picked up in bonus stages. The game is Fast and Furious programmed by Richard Bayliss with some absolutely excellent music by Thomas Mogensen, a member of Maniacs of Noise and Epic C64 Music Group. The game is easy to play, sports really good graphics and can be played in quick short bursts and with 25 levels in total you're in for a real challenge. This game is PAL format only and is also free or name your own price from Cytronic with a physical version also available. Number 83 Gold Quest 6 Under the Spell of the Seven Dragons Extended Edition was released in the first quarter of 2022 by the New Dimension on the C64. It's the latest in an ongoing dungeon crawling series that started way back in 2005, built then using the shoot 'em up construction engine by Sledgy and Richard Bayliss. This sixth installment though abandons that and is fully programmed in basic while using the pet ski art style and it really takes this series to the next level. Your dwarven character sets out on a quest to save Sledgy trapped at the bottom of the dungeon. The game's goal is to free Sledgy and defeat the orc and dragon bosses but also to loot as much as possible on the way, thus making your name into the great book of dwarven heroes or the high school table for us regular folk. This game takes the complexity of old school dungeon crawlers and throws it out the window making playing this game 100% accessible with just a joystick and nothing else and it works exceptionally well and doesn't lessen the detail detail or mountains of options available and of course you can still choose to use the keyboard if you wish. You get to make your own character and then set off into the abyss. You have a handy map that shows where you've gone so you never really get lost. An action window shows items, enemies and characters you come across with your basic stats and the menus below for selecting items from your backpack or talking to people etc etc. It's very slick and no need for separate screens for any other information. Fighting is all stat based so once you decide to fight it's whoever has the biggest weapon and stats basically wins. It's simple and straight to the point. The dungeon levels are littered with all manner of interesting events. Beasts to fight, traps, people to talk to and trade items or buy stuff. It's extremely diverse and the quick paced nature the game mean you never really get bored. Between levels you can also stop at taverns to replenish your HP, go buy items such as weapons or armor or take on special quests. Special items can also be bought that have various effects like reveal the entire map instantly for example. This game is just loaded with personality and charm and sports excellent colorful pet ski graphics and has the option for either German or English language. A great title music track from Richard Bayliss who always delivers a rocking good tune and just simple easy to get into gameplay. Basically this is a must play for all you dungeon bashers out there.
Number 82. So, 35 years after its initial release, we finally got to see an unofficial port of Kings Valley to the C64 in 2020. So how does it stack up to the MSX original? Pretty simply, I would say it's slightly better in my opinion. Just like a lot of new C64 games, it uses the high res mode to make some really nice detailed graphics, especially on the main character who looks much more detailed than the MSX original. The team also managed to port the entire game as well, all 15 tunes, with a nice music score which pretty much replicates the original exactly. The game was programmed by Mario Mora and has been released through rebitmagazine.it and I'll leave a link to it in the description. It was originally slated to be a full commercial release through Cytronic Software with them even trying to work out some sort of official deal with Konami. But alas, something went wrong and Cytronic pulled out, which means the awesome Steve Day loader screen is now no longer, unfortunately, part of the game. The positive aspect to this is that the game is still available through Rebit, and now that the fact that it's unofficial, it is also free. The game is extremely fun, and you could probably compare it to Load Runner in terms of gameplay. It's very arcadey, but at the same time, it's pretty strategic, and I think it's these elements which make it so addictive. With the main gameplay mechanic being you can only carry one item at time, so knowing when to pick up a knife or a shovel for digging or jumping your way out of a bad situation, there's a lot of fun to be had. You should check this one out, you'll be pleasantly surprised. Number 81 Asblox Plus is a total love letter to Pengo and games of its style, and was originally released as a cell phone game. It was designed by classic C64 programmer Carl Hornell, who also did cleanup service, fungus, and velocipede on the C64. Carl decided to convert his game to the Commodore in 2018, which was a perfect fit for the system. The C64 actually got the original Pengo version, as well as the really fun clone game, Chilly Willy. The game has you controlling a penguin who is trying to loot gold coins out of the ice blocks for no apparent reason all the while he's getting attacked by various creatures. Using ice blocks like Pengo to crush your opponents and loot the blocks is how you finish each level. The game has a slightly slower pace than Pengo but it gets really intense the more creatures appear on screen. The graphics are very nice and arcadey and have a lot of variety level wise way more than Pengo and the music especially the loader title is quite an excellent SID tune and is well worth a listen for chiptune fans. The game is a free download also digital but in 2019 it was re-released by Cytronic Software for the C64 in tape and disc format and is a wonderful physical version to own. I'll leave a link in the description so you can check that out. It's a fun game in a classic arcade way that fits really well gameplay and style-wise on the old bread box. And number 80 is... Curse Tomb was released in mid-2023 by ProDivision on the Commodore 64. Their action puzzle game has been in development for a very long time by the creator of the 2018 C64 game Yump 64, a technically very impressive trailblazer-style game published by RGCD. Curse Tomb is a very fast-paced action puzzle-style game where you have to loot every level of a trap-infested tomb of its jewels while on a strict timer. You simply push the direction you want to go and try not to die. Quick reactions and thought has to go into every move as you use the walls and objects to stop yourself from getting killed in various traps inside the tomb. The further the levels get, the way more interesting and diverse the rooms become. And obviously the challenge increases. Each of the 75 levels offer new tricks and enemies from ghosts, sparks and moving platforms and even teleportation devices. All adding to the quick thinking puzzle aspect of the game. I honestly, before doing in this review wasn't sure if I was gonna like this game. Timers and puzzles are not high on my game playlist, at least not in this kind of combination, but I was pleasantly surprised and quickly addicted to seeing what the next level had in store. Fortunately the game has an autosave feature and multiple difficulty modes, so if this is not your normal gaming style you can still enjoy it. The graphics are simple but work well. The further you get through the more dense and rich they become, rewarding your success visually. The music is enjoyable from the ominous title tune to the fast paced adventure tracks of the in-game music. It hits well with some good sound effects. Protovision themselves have also released the game in digital and physical form, disc and cartridge, with a gorgeous manual and box. And I'll leave links in the description if you're interested in picking them up. And the game is also Mini Maxi, PAL and NTSC compatible, so all your C64 bases are covered. And is another nice new C64 game that's totally worth a look. We interrupt our program to bring you this important message.
and I'll stop this list here for the first time and give you just a few honorable mentions here. A few games that didn't quite make this list. Haskell is another excellent multi-directional shooter from Mika Misfit and a great companion piece to a Super Gotron release. The Ooze is a great little action puzzler and an enhanced conversion of a ZX Spectrum game with lovely graphics and music and a cool Metroidvania vibe. Organism is a flawed 2018 Archon 64 release and is a survival horror style game in the Project Firestart mold. It's good but just need a little bit more variety to make it a classic. Bagman Comes Back is an excellent unofficial port of the arcade game Bagman from 1982, done in a very detailed style by Luca Carminati of LC Games. Vampire Vengeance is a 2023 conversion of an action platformer from the ZX Spectrum and is just fun arcade style single screen action at its best. Spark is an unofficial port of a Vectrex action vector platformer from 1983 and was done extremely well by Wernersoft. Rescuing Orc is a cute 2017 flip screen action adventure with nice simple graphics and good tunes. Fizz is a very very clever 2023 puzzle game by Andy Dorman that also features an impressive two-player co-op mechanic for more devious puzzles. Wormhole is an underappreciated 2020 ProDivision release that's a side-scrolling action platformer with impressive visuals and sound design. And lastly is Plechthora, a 2021 shoot 'em up by Dr. Mortal Wombat and just a very fun and visually impressive product that shouldn't be overlooked. And those are all well worth checking out as well. And now back to the countdown. Number 79. Outrage was released at the tail end of 2020 on the C64 by Protovision and Cytronic Software. As you can see here, this game was clearly inspired by Hawkeye. The game originally started its development cycle in 1990, but in 1993, however, 64 magazine held a competition for the best homebrew C64 game, with the winner getting the game actually physically published. Outrage ended up winning, but by this point, the distributor had gotten out of C64 publishing. Many years later, in 2005, Protovision stepped up to try and finish the game for publication, but it fell apart. Cytronic then took a shot at it in 2010, but it floundered as well. But finally, with the combined efforts of both companies, the game has finally seen the light of day. As you can see, the game now sports this excellent Steve Day loader screen that captures the action so well. The game comprises of five levels with bosses for each. However, seeing it all the way through is going to be a real challenge because the difficulty is damn hard. Gameplay wise it's simply a side scrolling run and gun affair. Blast everything you see including creatures and traps and keep on moving till the end where you'll face off against a boss character. There are also tons of shops that pop up during the level which you can use your cash which you picked up from dead beasties where you can buy ammo for your guns, health and smart bombs. Weapons wise you have four guns straight off the bat, each one more powerful than lost. Your main gun has unlimited ammo but the rest are all limited though and ammo needs to be bought in shops but they are really powerful and take out most creatures with one shot. You also have some screen killing smart bombs although I would suggest using them only on the main bosses because those guys are real bastards to beat. This game may look like Hawkeye but it plays quite differently in most respects. There's a lot of cheap trial and error deaths crazy hard bosses and some jumping platform action that results in, yeah you guessed it, even more deaths. I'm not a huge fan of the fact that your health is constantly draining no matter what even if you're not getting hit. It's kind of a cheap way of just making you try to rush a level. Having said all that, overall it is a pretty well put together game, it has nice graphics and it has some pretty good tunes but it is very tough and unforgiving just like games were when this was originally designed. So if you're not up for the challenge you may not not fair too well yet, but for everyone else it's a pretty good although slightly annoying run and gun challenge. Number 78 in 2013, we finally saw Berserk converted to the Commodore 64 in the form of Berserk Redux and released through RGCD. This is another one of those strange games that never got a C64 conversion despite its popularity, as in the case of Donkey Kong Jr., which I covered in a previous episode. Everything as we just saw is exactly the same, and the look and the feel of the game is replicated perfectly here, as is the sound, which this is one of the few versions featuring all the arcade voice songs, which the C64 SID chip replicates eerily well. There's also a nice loader screen and some cool menu music which adds a little extra to the overall feel of the game. The arcade addictiveness is still fully intact and you're gonna find yourself coming back again.
again and again to beat that score, which it also supports high score saving to disc, which is needed in a game like this. It's also NTSC and PAL compatible, and I've played it on both a real C64 and the C64 Mini, and the game works perfectly on both. This is an excellent conversion by the guys at Element 114 Software and RGCD, and you can tell everybody involved loved the original and really put the effort to replicate it as accurately as possible. A must play. Number 77. Arcade Days was released in the first quarter of 2021 through Cytronic Software, with programming duties by the Icon 64 team of Trevor Story, Stuart Collier and Soul Cross. This game was made in conjunction with the Zap 64 2021 annual, just like the previous two years which saw the team doing Sizzler and Lords of Dragon Spire for the previous annuals. Please check out my video on the new Zap 64 annual for more details, which also has a making of Arcade Days feature to check out as well. The game the game is essentially an old arcade simulator, giving you the chance to play 18 different clone arcades based on popular games from the glory days of gaming. It is essentially two games though, the straight up arcade segment and the fact that you need to collect coins and exchange them for tokens all the while avoiding the local arcade town bully, Kelly and her cat. She drops coins which you can exchange to play games, 10 coins are needed for a token, although most coins count as multiple so you only need to collect a few to play a game. The overall goal in this mode is to dethrone Kelly by completing every game and thus becoming the king of your local arcade. If you've ever played the C64 game Lazy Jones, it's also quite similar to that in play and style and the music definitely has overtones of that game. The arcade games themselves are quick, addictive fun and you'll know immediately what games they were cloning if you spent any time in an Eddie's arcade or have played any Atari 2600 games. You've got variations on Space Invaders, Tanks, Pac-Man, Centipede, Lunalander, Frogger, and variations on those variations, which all gets very inception-y. <laughs> Every time you complete a game, it's marked off in the arcade, so you know how many more you've got to go to complete the game. There are also three modes of play. Kitty and Master are basically medium and hard modes, with the third, Practice, which is there if you just want to jump in and play the games, free play style, without bothering with collecting tokens or avoiding Kelly and her cat. You do have lives in regular play, and one touch from Kelly and you'll lose one. Her cat can only stun you. Too many hits and it's game over. Overall, it's a fun experience. It's simple and addictive, and will definitely leave a big smile on your face with all those fun arcade nostalgia trips in every little game. The graphics are a nice combination of traditional C64 sprite work and high res style graphics, similar to most Icon 64 games. And the main tune by Soul Cross, like I said earlier, invokes the best of David Whittaker's Lazy Jones theme and the drone of that Space Invader sound effect tune. It's great. Check this one out on your C64. It's it's a real blast from the past. Number 76. In April of 2023, we saw the release of The Lost Realms of Murakusada Episode 2 hit the Commodore 64 by Arconix Labs. If you don't know what this is, it's basically a companion piece mini RPG light adventure game that's a standalone quest that is part of the backstory to Crimson Twilight, a C64 RPG that's been in development for over a decade now. A couple of years ago, we got Episode Number 1, which introduced us to the CRPG style game. With its own small adventure, this is the latest episode. This adventure is available for free and not only contains the new episode but also the original which has been upgraded to full joystick support so now you no longer have to play both episodes with keyboard only. The backstory to this episode is that you summoned by the king this time to go find the scrolls of Avalon which are said to be maps to special weapons in other realms. The first episode had you looking basically for the holy grail so I feel the overarching story here may lead up to you going against the king as he sounds like he might be be the big bad in the final game. That's just a theory though. All of this backstory is available in the handy PDF that comes with the game download and you can check it out in game as well. Basic gameplay is you move block to block as fast or as slow as you want. You need to exit each screen to continue the adventure. Along the way you can pick up food hidden in chests or trees. You can pick up treasure which you can use to buy weapons and find armor. All of this can also be seen on the right hand side of the screen so there's no need for separate menu selections. Special objects can also be picked up such as torches for dungeons 
dungeons or amulets to activate or help progress the story. There's a few light puzzle elements to be solved such as switches to hit and of course combat. This is handled in a pretty basic way and is based on your strength, weapons and armor that is equipped as it automatically plays out until one of you die. It's a tricky little game but not too difficult after multiple attempts. You need to watch out and not try to eat everything, there is poisonous stuff aplenty. And search carefully for those special hidden items and money to upgrade yourself early. The graphics are small and nice and detailed with a very early SSR look to them and the game has multiple wonderful medieval tunes for some really great atmosphere. I think the guys at Arcanics have done a really awesome job here. The game is easy and fun and a perfect starting point for people not used to this genre. It's unclear how many more episodes we'll get before the final release, but for now you can enjoy this for free in this wonderful little package. Downloads are in the video description. Number 75 Next was Tutankham, based on the 1982 arcade game by Konami and released by Stern in North America, which received a massive amount of 8-bit port, but not one to the C64. The arcade was a multi-directional scrolling maze game where you're an adventurer looting King Tut's pyramids of all its treasure while avoiding or blasting all bats, snakes and other creatures as you steal everything. You needed to pick up keys to open other passages and have what appears to be a laser gun which you can use to blast enemies. The trick is you can only shoot left or right which adds a lot of strategy to the mix, especially when avoiding enemy encounters from the top or bottom. I played this as a kid in the arcade only a couple of times. I simply found the game to be way too hard and it was definitely aimed at the veteran Robotron crowd as opposed to the more casuals that just wanted to have some fun in the arcade gaming. This new C64 version was put together by Luca Carminati of LC Games who also did a nice version of Bagman on the C64 which I looked at in New Retro episode number 31. This C64 the 64 version was released in February 2022 and is a brilliant interpretation of the arcade. The game is practically the same but doesn't have that defender style radar system at the top of the screen which to be honest was completely pointless in this game at least I always thought. The sound effects are way better as well and far less abrasive and thank goodness Luca emitted the footstep sounds from the arcade which were super annoying. It moves at a really fast pace but not as fast as the arcade and is very responsive and I really like the look of the graphics. It's close to the arcade but with a nice chunky C64 flair to it. It's still a tough game though, so be warned. But it does come with selectable difficulty settings and the game is also NTSC and PAL compatible for all C64 owners to enjoy. And as of making this, LC Games put out Tutankham Returns, a sort of C64 exclusive version made up of seven new stages using this game's engine. So if you want more Tutankham, it's available. Number 74 Joe Gun Gold Edition was released by Cytronic Software in 2009 in physical form and is a fun puzzle styled adventure game coded by Jorg Rottensteiner, a frequent collaborator with the Archon 64 team on games such as Barnsley Badger and Soulless. This is a very simple looking game but very atmospheric with you playing Joe, an archaeologist who stumbles across an unplundered pyramid in Egypt of a mysterious king whose past has been erased from history. Thus you decide to traverse this trap and creature infested place to find out its secrets. The gameplay is mainly puzzle solving, finding items and figuring out where to use them to open up new paths to further explore the pyramid, as well as light platforming elements. The game is pretty big with over 70 individual rooms to search and explore, with the only negative being that it's not very clear what can and cannot be interacted with. So you're going to have to partake in some tedious trial and error to get the gist of the interactive elements. Although some of the room names do give you clues to that. But besides that, it's a pretty enjoyable experience overall. The main title theme music is also very good by Thomas Peterson. With tons of artifacts to find, with lots of different abilities to experiment with, and plenty of secrets to discover for those eagle-eyed adventurers. Make it another fun game to try out with a free or name your own price digital version. And a physical one also from Cytronic themselves. Number 73 37 years after its original release we finally get a port of Attic Attack to the C64. And when I say port I mean that in the most basic sense as this version is greatly enhanced over the original from its excellent colourful C64 style graphics which are well animated and the cool atmospheric music. The gameplay is still the same though as you get to choose between a wizard, surf and knight as in the original. Running around finding secret rooms behind bookshelves, blasting beasties and collecting items 
buttons and keys to open new areas are all here making this feel and play just like the original. This is definitely a labor of love conversion from the team of Stephen Day on graphics who's lent his talents to so many great C64 conversions over the last few years such as 2014's Donkey Kong Jr and 2011's excellent Prince of Persia conversions which I've covered in the series as well if you want to check them out. The coding was done by the highly talented Tomcat of the C64 cracking group Nostalgia, the guys that gave us the enhanced version of the Chris Butler classics Commando and Ghosts and Goblins. And this is not just a simple conversion as it also includes some secret side missions and items added exclusively to this version. With this and all the recent enhanced ports of Ultimate games to the C64 like Night Law and Alien 8 amongst many more, the Commodore is getting pretty close to the entire Ultimate library available, which is a pretty amazing contribution by everybody that supports this awesome computer. There's hoping we'll see many more years of excellent unconverted ports to this great system. Number 72. Battle Kingdom was published by Cytronic Software in 2021 on the Commodore 64 with the game being another Archon 64 production where the hits just keep on coming, this game being no exception. It's an action arcade adventure game where you are the noble knight, Sir Bob, who has to rescue a bunch of princesses who have been taken prisoner by a group of dodgy dragons. If you've ever played the arcade game Venture then it's pretty similar to that. In the game you have to run around the kingdom and enter a bunch of buildings and defeat the creatures inside. Your goal is to put together a sword which can be used to defeat the dragon. There are 8 of them in total which is also the amount of levels in the game. You have a bow and some arrows as your main weapon with limited arrows to defeat the beasts. So don't go all mental with the fire button. Defeating them however either leaves loot, more arrows or a piece of the sword. Once all the pieces of the sword are put together the main castle keep is accessible and you can now use the sword and face off against one of the many dragons. Each building you enter is a bit of a mystery as you never know what you're going to be facing off against which is pretty fun. Don't try to rush in and kill them all either it'll just lead to your death. Play it cool and let them come to you and take them out one by one. Patience will definitely serve you well in many of the buildings. Also if you do go a little bit trigger happy and waste all your arrows, fear not cause they'll slowly respawn so you're never at a total loss to progress in the game. When on the map screen as well, beeline it for the first available building. Don't dilly dally. Besides dodging the roaming beast you have to be quick or else the dragon will leave the keep and hunt you down resulting in a loss of a life. As you can see the graphics on this game are fantastic. I just love that combination of high res style mixed in with the more chunky C64 sprite work. I think it just looks exceptional and is the variety in the buildings and the creatures. Trevor Story provided the graphics and game design and this is another job well done. Music is another treat with resident Archon 64 collaborator Soul Cross providing some more great tunes which in his typical style build themselves up very slowly until the full beat is in place. The loader tune is particularly awesome. Akim Volk provides his usual coding magic and this game feels really on point to play. Quick responsive controls and the game definitely has that just one more go addictive quality that's always a sign of a well crafted arcade game. It's also balanced really well with it being challenging but not too annoying. The dragon bosses go from a walk in the park to totally crazy which is actually quite fun to deal with and rescuing all 8 princesses is going to take quite a while to complete. The game is both NTSC and PAL compatible and works on a real C64, C64 Mini and Maxi and is available in digital and physical forms from Cytronic Software. They have tape and disc versions available right now but no word on cartridge versions if they're going to release that. I'll leave a link in the description to Cytronic Software to check them out. As per usual Trevor, Sol and Akim have crafted together another excellent gem of a C64 title to add to Archon 64's impressive backlog of gems. If you like fantasy and arcade style action games then this game is going to be right up your alley. Number 71. Death Flood Dungeon of Doom was released on the C64 at the beginning of May of 2023 by Windigo Productions. It's an action platformer set in a fantasy world where you as an avid adventurer hear about an abandoned castle that was once the home of a long dead necromancer. This castle is supposedly filled to the brim with treasure for the taking. You make your way to the bottom and start plundering but inadvertently set off a series of traps and this is where the game starts with your goal to make it up and back
back out the castle as it self-destructs, unleashing all its traps and monsters. As you're escaping, you also have to loot as much treasure as possible, which will determine one of the many multiple endings you'll receive. Death Flood is a welcome breath of fresh air on the C64, with a simple twist on regular gameplay. You have something very fun, challenging and unique. The game lets you choose between two different characters, a barbarian and an amazon, each giving you a slightly different gameplay experience, with the barbarian being slow, stronger and having smaller jumps, and the amazon having speed, weaker attacks but longer jump distances. The choice is yours. Each of the 19 levels start you off at the bottom of the screen as you try to scramble your way up to the top and reach an exit. The castle is flooding, so water is filling up, making you have to think fast, with most levels having multiple paths to take to reach the exit. You need to pick up keys to open doors, treasure to fill out your overall status, and fight many creatures you come across, or simply avoid them. If you get swallowed by the water, it's not instant death as well, as you have air in the form of a lung meter at the top of the screen, where you got time to grab a key or treasure underwater before popping back up, as long as air permits. Going over that means your health will start to drain, and inevitably it'll be your end. You have to think on your feet quickly, jumping over traps, deciding what treasures to take, and which creatures to attack or avoid. The castle has three distinct looks as you make your way up, coupled with many new monsters introduced along the way for a lot of variety. Considering this is Wendigo Productions first C64 game, it is quite impressive, with lush well defined graphics that get better the further you get, great sound effects and some extremely good SID tunes that really fit the mood of the game overall. It's pretty easy to play with mid range difficulty, the more you play it, the better it gets in my opinion. The best part is the game is free for the digital download, with a gorgeous physical version being available from Polyplay, and the link to the digital version will be in the video description. It's both NTSC and PAL compatible, although it was designed for PAL systems, so if you're playing it through emulation, it's suggested you use PAL settings. It also features useful ProtoVision's ProtoPad to give it a bit more of a console type experience. Windigo said that this game was inspired by old C64 classics such as Barbarian and Hero Quest, and those elements kick-started the idea as the game went into full production in 2020. They also have their second game of production right now called Devolution, which is a real-time strategy game, so hopefully we'll be seeing that also in the not too distant future. Death Flood is a great experience, offering new elements to a basic genre and is well worth the time spent with it. Number 70 Rocket Smash EX was released in 2015 on the Commodore 64 by RGCD. To say this game is inspired by Jetpack would be an understatement, but seeing as the C64 never got an official port of Jetpack itself, you can think of this as the version for the system. The game was originally released in 2013 as part of RGCD's 16KB game development competition, and you can think of the EX as meaning this is the special upgraded edition of the game. The basics of the gameplay are exactly the same as Jetpack. Assemble your spaceship, refuel it, and escape the area. After a few stages, you'll escape the planet and move on to the next one. The first planet is easy, but after that, things really start to pick up difficulty wise, and the game does feature three difficulty settings, so you'll never feel like the odds are completely hopeless. The game also has an arcade mode and a story mode. The arcade mode is exactly like you'd expect, it's just level after level of relentless, intense action. But the story mode adds cutscenes after every few levels, which show your guy trying to make it back to Earth but either by his incompetence or really bad luck, he keeps on blowing up the ship, which adds a good dose of humor to the fun of this little game. The further you get, the more hazards appear, meteors, aliens, and everything is out to kill you. And unlike Jetpack, you also have an oxygen meter, which is ticking down all the time, which is basically making you get on with the game and keep the pace at the max, which I have no problem with in this style of game. Sol Cross, who also worked on Galencia, did the music and graphics, which are both really good, nice and colorful. I I really like the loader music for this game and the sound effects do a good job as well and even feature some digitized speech. There's a really nice physical cart version of the game you can get from RGCD as well as a digital version and the Citronic website also has a tape and disc versions so you covered on every format for this excellent arcade type game that'll definitely have you saying just one more go over and over. Game over. We interrupt our program to bring you this important message. Number 
1969. Terrestrial was released by Cytronic Software in December of 2022 and was my most anticipated C64 game of the year. Unfortunately, it's a good game but has some really frustrating gameplay mechanics. But let's talk about all the positives first because there is a lot and it's another visually beautiful game by Icon64. No strangers to the modern C64 scene, giving us so many gems over the last decade. Terrestrial finds you as Captain Havoc trying to stop an alien invasion, one man in a spaceship style. The game itself is broken down into about 7 main levels with 9 or so mini games in total. And this is the game's biggest plus, it's the sheer variety of gameplay on offer here is pretty astounding and impressive. Like most Archon games, it's a big old homage to classic C64 gaming, with its style taken from the likes of Beachhead, Raid over Moscow, Cabell and Buck Rogers and it successfully manages to mix all these styles together to make a really varied and exciting gameplay experience. The downside is some of these mini games are beyond frustrating. The second level in particular, taking out the capital ship with your long range cannons. Even after reading the instructions really carefully it took literally hours of gameplay to try and get past it. Which is a real shame and it's super frustrating and I feel like 90% of people are going to simply just give up and not see the rest of this excellent game. Lots of the other levels though are fun, like the Buck Rogers and Cabal levels, with the tank sections being my personal favourites which are just so much fun. But that's only if you get past the second level, good luck on that. I think the team of Trevor Story, Stuart Collier and Soul Cross are really excellent and one of the best teams of the modern C64 scene. They have again delivered another gem that is both PAL and NTSC compatible and is available in both physical and digital versions. And although I complained a lot about the second level, just please read the instructions very carefully first before trying to attempt it. It'll make your gameplay experience so much better and hopefully you'll get to enjoy the rest of this excellent game. Number 68. Oxymoxy Moxie was released by RGCD in the third quarter of 2020. RGCD present. It's an action puzzle game coded and put together by the team of Antonio Savona. Lobo and Aldo Kumo. The story for the game goes an old wizard accidentally casts a spell which causes the whole kingdom to be overrun by dodgy chattering skulls that just won't shut up. Similar to Boney from the trapdoor. Board, board, board. I say, Burke, what about a game of I Spy? Damn, that guy was chatty. But two cats step up to the task, Boxy and Moxie, and go about destroying them so everyone in the kingdom can have a good night's sleep. The gameplay is essentially a puzzle game where destroying the skulls and the least amount of moves is the objective. The less moves it takes, the higher your ranking will be, therefore earning you more stars. The amount of stars you possess is how the levels are unlocked. So the better you do, the further you get. The gameplay is simple and easy to get to grips with. You control both cats. With a simple press of the fire button you can jump between them. One cat you position to block the other's movements while the other is capable of destroying the skulls. It's a simple addictive puzzle element but makes it a lot of fun to play. And this is coming from a person who's not a massive fan of this genre of game. The game does sport a massive 60 levels overall spread across three distinctly different settings from around the kingdom. You'll probably eventually get to a point where you won't be able to go any further because you're going to need more stars. Fortunately you can go back on levels and try to do better to get that extra star. As far as the graphics go, it's really top notch quality with very bright and colourful levels and excellent menu screens, intermission and a very cool ending. A lot of time and effort has obviously gone into it for sure. You can also select sound effects or music, which is good because the castle music level is quite grating. But besides that track, the rest of the music is really quite catchy and some great little SID tunes. It also features a bunch of digitized cat meows, which is also pretty cool. The game is available digitally as a pay what you want title, which is nice so there's no reason not to try it out. And it's also NTSC and PAL compatible. You can also purchase, as of making this video, a physical cart version from RGCD which comes with all the excellent extras that they always throw in as well. And if you're finding the game a little bit too hard, the group access has a nice downloadable trainer available as well if you want to cheat or do some level skipping. I'll leave a link in the description for all three of these so you can check them out. Overall it's a well made addictive little puzzle that's a nice distraction from all the other over complicated stuff you may be playing so why not give it a go. Number 67 
In 2021, the C64 finally got a port of Phoenix in the form of Phoenix Recovered by Sorbus, a coder from Austria. There was no official port back in the 80s, with the Atari 2600 being the only system to get one, and a pretty good rendition considering its limits. The C64 did, however, get a few clones as expected, with 1991's Mega Phoenix being the most blatant by Dynamic, which is a pretty fun, although way too easy variation on the classic title. Fast forward to 2020. 21, and we finally have Phoenix Recovered available for free for all to enjoy. It's a pretty faithful rendition of the arcade shooter, right down to the fact that it's actually presented in Tate mode. And I'll flip the screen here so you can actually see the game in action. If you're unfamiliar with the term, it's a feature offered for vertical shooters ported to consoles, where you can tilt your monitor to the side to play the game, so the game is presented in its original longer vertical mode. Many great Japanese Sega Saturn titles offer this option. As for the game, I just love the graphics. They really do capture the arcade really well with that early 80s computer look and it looks quite a bit different than most C64 games. The sound effects are completely different which you may not like as the original sound effects are so iconic. They're definitely not as good but I don't mind it to be honest and it's its own game after all. It is pretty easy though and you'll blow through it quickly but that was the style of these games back then chasing that score to take down your friends. Overall it's a fun conversion of one of my personal favorite early arcade games and totally worth a download. Number 66 Trogue 64, Drain of Doom on Commodore 64. This game is an absolute love letter to the classic 80s rogue game, but also bringing its own unique elements to the mix. The backstory is there was a zombie outbreak in the 80s in a small town, but the residents were able to lead the slow moving horde down to the bottom of an abandoned mine and then flooded it. Unfortunately, the trove, or drain in a sense, has been removed, causing the mine to drain. Your character starts at the bottom floor and you need to work your way up all 64 levels to the surface, all the while activating the 8 pumps spread throughout to refill the mine. All the classic roguelike elements are here, looting for equipment, battling creatures like skeletons, toads, slime, etc, turn based moves, randomized levels and of course permadeath. This game is extremely addictive and feels very modern even though it looks extremely retro. I love the fact that you also have to use the keyboard to play it, just like with the original Rogue. The game was programmed and designed by Wolfgang Botcher, who used to run a number of BBSs in the 1980s. He's got his own website here, which I'll leave a link to in the description, and you can read up on all his latest Commodore 64 projects. The music in this game is fantastic as well, and is done by TDM of the C64 demo group Triad and is a great atmospheric SID tune. The best part of everything here is that the game is free so check out csdb.dk I'll leave a link in the description so you can download it and it plays perfectly on a real C64 through VAS and on the C64 mini although I'd highly recommend plugging in the keyboard obviously for the controls. It's a great game and a classic style so be sure to check it out. Number 65 Gates of the Ancient was released in the second half of 2021 exclusively on the Commodore 64. It was created by Dr. Mortal Wombat who also did the excellent recently released C64 shoot 'em up Plekthora. The game itself is a throwback to the classic space exploration genre that I played and loved so much. The basic plot of the game has you as a regular space jockey who happens to find an ancient artifact in space. You then use it which opens up a wormhole to another galaxy. You're now stuck somewhere in the great deep and have to navigate your way home. When you download the game, it comes with a nifty PDF instruction manual. I'd highly suggest reading it first. You're gonna need to know a few basic keyboard functions. But besides that, it's very easy to get into and play, which is usually the opposite of this genre. Once you start playing, the gameplay involves three major components. Battles, exploration, and trading. These three components help you move from galaxy to galaxy, help you upgrade your ship, and help you survive attacks by pirates, aliens, and robots. This game is a lot more focused than say Elite for example. Initially you're on a path but after a few jumps things get bigger and more open. It's a good way to ease you into a massive game. Your main functions are waypoints in the bottom right of the screen and each new galaxy has a new set of them but you don't know what you will encounter. It could be a minefield, another warp gate, a trading post and a whole lot of other possibilities. Along the way you'll no doubt be attacked and this is where the excellent fast paced space battles occur with fully shaded 3D models moving at a cracking pace. Your ship's lasers are initially pretty weak to begin with, but fortunately enemies only need a couple
couple of good hits to be destroyed, which eliminates one of the most tedious aspects of the genre when battles play themselves out for way too long. As you explore waypoints and fight, you'll be picking up cargo left by dead pirates or come across a minefield which if you shoot all the mines you get money. Money and cargo can be used at trading posts to buy upgrades for your ship like better propulsion, lasers, shields and more. You'll also come across artifacts which have special abilities like opening up walk gates and other functions and they'll also aid you big time in making your way back home eventually. The game successfully manages to combine my three favorite space games into one neat package. Elite, Space Rogue and Wing Commander. It's got the grand although much more focused exploration and trading of Elite, the wonderful 3D graphics, presentation and story aspect of Space Rogue and the fast paced battle stylings of Wing Commander. The best feature though is the password system. If you die you'll get a code to start your new game and all your money and artifacts will be carried over. In that sense you never feel like you just wasted an hour of your life and the nature of continuing to build up your ship is enforced and is a wonderful addition. The game is also free and is PAL compatible, although it supposedly also runs on NTSC at a slightly faster rate. This is a very impressive game and it's nice to see someone do a genre like this on the C64 as most new games are usually of the arcade style variety. If you like the classic games I mentioned earlier then this should be your cup of tea. Number 64 Iron Sword 2 was released in 2020 by Double Sided Games. It's a game in the genre that rarely gets any support in the modern era on the C64, namely the RPG. And this is a full on RPG, much in the vein of the classic Ultima games or early SSI titles of the era. Although this one has a twist, it really doesn't take itself too seriously, which makes it break out of the mold of most RPGs. The story involves you trying to track down the hot elf girl you met in the bar the previous night before getting so drunk and passing out. It's a traditional top-down RPG with all the tropes intact. The battles, however, are turn-based but are super fast, making it feel much more modern in that respect. The world is pretty big with 9 massive dungeons to explore and over 30 unique monsters to fight. Also the armor and weapons you find are randomly generated, much like the modern game Borderlands for example. This is a fun and very easy to pick up RPG with quirky modern humor that may not be for everyone and fast-paced battles. It's available in physical and and digital forms and the digital version comes with the original hired sword game as a bonus which you don't have to have played to enjoy this one. It's a great C64 variation on the classic RPG mechanics by Double Sided Games. And at number 63 Metal Warrior 3 was released by Covert Bit Ops in 2001 and is the third part of this run and gun action adventure series. The game was a game done mostly by one man, the maniac Las Aone, who did coding, graphics and some of the music as well. And if you've never played any of his games then check out Hessian and Steel Ranger and prepare to be amazed. This one continues the story from the previous games with some of your band members getting captured by the government due to the previous story arc and you as one of the members, Goat who escapes to start his revenge spree. The game has all the tropes of the previous entries with great storytelling, a day-night cycle, which affects the types of enemies encountered and whether the shops or facilities will be open, more character stats and weapons to buy and eventually, if you get far enough, multiple characters to switch between during gameplay. And that's the biggest problem here, getting anywhere in this game is brutally difficult, especially the beginning, which will probably be enough to put most people off, which is a real shame. It's definitely not as well balanced as the excellent part 4 or the even better Metal Warrior Ultra featured in my best C64 games from 2011 to 2021 video. Zap64 also reviewed this in a March 2002 review in which they said I quote just lacking a bit in the challenge stakes which is hilarious on so many levels. I mean were they playing the same game? Seriously? <laughs> Regardless it's here because it's a good game overall if you can survive long enough to enjoy it that is. Number 62 Barnsley Badger was designed by Trevor Story and released by Cytronic Software in 2016. Trevor Story has been a pretty prolific designer in the last few years on the Commodore 64, making a bunch of really brilliant games like Organism and The Legend of Atlantis, just to name a couple. This however is nothing like those and is a perfect almost companion piece to the Monty Legacy, or more specifically the third game, Monty on the Run. Barnsley, just like Monty, is a down on his luck dude, just looking to make a quick buck. He hears a story about buried treasure in his local graveyard, so being the vagabond he is, he goes to steal it before anyone else so he can pay off his ridiculous debts, or so the story goes. The first thing you'll notice is the Spectrum styled Monty graphics, which they have been able to replicate so well here, and I absolutely love it. 
Back in the day I always scoffed at this style of graphics, but honestly, I quite like it now. It feels retro, but just in the right way. Collecting and dodging is the prime gameplay, just like in Monty, but the game is a lot more forgiving than that department, which makes the game more fun to play as a result. Trying to find all the treasures is an absolute blast. Collecting power-ups like the glowy stones, which you use in your slingshot, which is an absolutely awesome addition to the game, and just plain exploring the 120 screens this little beast has to offer is so much fun. In the digital download, you also are provided with a map of the whole game, so it gives you a nice idea of the scope of it and the lay of the land. The music by Andrew Fisher is very cool as well. From the loading tune to the actual game, it's just great stuff. I also like the modern sensibilities, like the checkpoints scattered all over the place, indicated by these blue fire things that make traversing this place a lot more enjoyable. The level design is also well done, and each jump and platform seems to be set up really well to challenge and keep the pace going, as Barnsley moves a bit faster than Monty, so it's a bit of a quicker game, but still retains that Monty feel excellently. If you own a C64 and love platformers, then this is an awesome addition to your collection that is fun, charming, and just the right amount of difficult. Number 61 Shadow Gate. It's kind of odd how this game never came to the C64, being that the first two games in this adventure series by Arcom, 1985's awesome film noir adventure, Deja Vu, and 86's horror-tinged outing, The Uninvited, both got very good and well-loved versions on the C64, but Shadow Gate just never ended up happening. The game has you traveling to Castle Shadow Gate to kill an evil warlock who is attempting to resurrect a behemoth from hell. Lots of puzzle solving and tons of trial and error is needed to make your way all the way to the end, with death literally around every corner. The conversion of this game to the C64 was done by Donnie Russell, who previously did the wonderful arcade conversion of Venture to the C64 as well, and was featured in Volume 5 of this series. The C64 conversion is based not on the original Mac version, but 1989's NES release done by Chemco, who also ended up porting Deja Vu and The Uninvited as well to that system. The C64 version, now called Castle Shell, Shadowgate is a pretty accurate conversion of the NES incarnation, with its own bit of C64 charm with graphics and SID interpretations of the music, and it feels like the NES version in terms of gameplay but has its own vibe that's distinctly different. The interface was also redone for the NES version to work with the controller, and the C64 version takes this approach as well, with Donny also providing support for a Commodore 1351 mouse, so you actually get the best of both worlds. The game itself is just as engaging, with lots of dying and puzzle solving ahead as you make your way further and further into the castle, and although I don't find it quite as memorable as Deja Vu, my favourite in this series, it's still a quality conversion done solely by one person, which is an amazing amount of work, and definitely deserves a look for all budding C64 adventurers. Number 60 the Wild Bunch was released in 2009 by Cytronic Software and is a conversion of a 1985 game by Firebird, which was originally released on the ZX Spectrum and Amstrad CPC. The game is kind of like an adventure game mixed with elements of the Oregon Trail, in which you find a recently dead guy. The same time a sheriff sees you pick up his gun off the ground, you're falsely now on the run from the sheriff for murder, and you now have to clear your name and find the member of the Wild Bunch who committed the crime. You have to go from town to town to track down the Wild Bunch following clues and avoiding the authorities. You need to manage resources and money very carefully as you make your choices, buying supplies like food and ammo etc from shops, interacting with townsfolk to get info, and trying not to get yourself into trouble and ending up in a local Hanyun duel. Travelling from town to town takes a set number of days, so getting the right amount of water, food and extra supplies, and allowing for all those random Oregon Trail type events that will occur, is all part of the very unpredictable fun nature of this game. The graphics are very simplistic in presentation, with a bunch of added graphics and musical enhancements over the 80s originals, with the music and sound effects being particularly impressive, with its main theme will definitely stick in your head for days, and overall it's just a really enjoyable experience, available from Cytronic Software in both physical and digital forms. We interrupt our program to bring you this important message. Looking back into the Commodore 64's library reveals many games, more games than any other computer or system ever made, and with that, too many great titles got lost in the shuffle. This series is dedicated to highlighting these forgotten gems. Welcome to Commodore 64 Deep Cuts.
Number 59. Scramble Infinity hit the C64 in 2021 by developer Five O'Clock Software as part of the Zap 64 cover mount games for that month. But don't let that make you think that this is some cheap quick put together game because it's a full remake of the arcade Scramble but given a 1990s style C64 overhaul in the graphics, music and sound effects department and is absolutely gorgeous to look at and listen to. We saw earlier the excellent Thomas Carr 2015 version which replicates the arcade to a T. This one keeps all that excellent gameplay and gives the best looking and sounding version of this game out there. If you're a fan of the arcade or horizontal shooters in general, then this is an absolute treat. Number 58 so this isn't just one game but it's three and I wanted to highlight them as a group of conversions done by Antonio Savona and his team. The three games in question are Chopper Command, Keystone Capers and Frostbite, all released in 2019. These are a bunch of Atari Activision classics from the early 80s that for whatever reason never got a conversion to the C64 until now. All three of these are pure labors of love from the team that built these games from the ground up for the C64 with lush colorful graphics and some excellent new C64 SID tunes by Sol Cross on all the games to spice them up C64 style and some excellent new title screens. Chopper Command is a cool Defender style clone by Bob Whitehead who went on to form Accolade a couple years later. Keystone Capers is a fun side scroller by programmer Gary Kitchen who also made the excellent C64 software title called Gary Kitchen Game Maker. And lastly is Frostbite by Steve Cartwright that's a bit of a mix of Frogger, Qbert and other arcades of the early 80s period. Period. All three of these games are free as they are unofficial conversions of old Activision games and are totally worth checking out with their great attention to detail, nailing that gameplay and actually improving on the graphics to make them much better with some great music. Find these and load them up. Number 57 Rogue 64 was published in January 2022 by Bitmap Soft, with the game being developed by Badger Punch Games on the Commodore 64. This is the same team behind 2020's fun arcade ROM Showdown also on the C64 and featured in episode number 25 of my new retro series. This game however is in a completely different genre, that being a procedurally generated roguelike. If you're unfamiliar with the genre, it's about trying to see how far you can make it in a dungeon before dying. Strategy and light RPG elements and easy to get to grips with gameplay make this a fun entry level RPG style genre to get into and that applies to this game as well. I was lucky enough to talk to lead programmer Ricky Sickinger about the making of this game. Hello my name is Ricky Sickinger, I'm a developer at Badger Bunch Games. For the last two years we've been working on uh, Commodore 64 games and uh, Rogue 64 is our latest one. Rogue 64 is a simple but very addictive game. It starts out easy but thankfully ramps up the difficulty slowly so you never find yourself too frustrated. The story for the game has you as an explorer looking for some fortune and glory and taking on the challenge of trying to make it to the bottom of a deadly dungeon known as Mordekum to claim its treasure. And it goes without saying that the further you go the more deadly it becomes. I asked Ricky if he could tell us a bit more about the team behind this game. Hanning is our graphics guy, Hanning Ludvigsen. He's a really really good artist and I've known him since the demo days back on the Amiga in the 90s. So we We've been cooperating quite a while, both back in the demo scene and then later on we uh, were in the company who made a MMO called Darkfall together. So I've known him for a long time and he's a really nice person to work with. Sami Luko, he does the music, great guy, makes lovely music. Got to know him the last uh, year or so because he helped us make the music for uh, Showdown and then uh, Snowdown. So yeah, he's a really great guy and a lovely musician. Gameplay is simple, you walk into Monsters Ease style to fight. You can pick up an array of potions to help you on your quest. These have various properties like healing, boosting your strength temporarily and killing all the monsters on screen. Your goal in each level is to find a key which can unlock the door to the next dungeon level. What I like about this game the most is the approach of having all the info and stats on the same screen, eliminating any extra input for other screens which streamlines not only the pace of the game but also the simplicity of the whole thing. I also Ricky about the idea behind doing this. The aim of uh, Rogue 64 has always been to uh, keep it as accessible as possible to people but at the same time uh, keeping it in the uh, roguelike genre. Uh, but the actual reason why uh, everything is on one screen and why the play screen is just 10 by 10 shells is uh, because of it's based on the Rogue 4K game and uh, in the Rogue 4K game we actually had a bigger play screen in the beginning uh, but then we found out that 
as I was getting to meeting the requirements and I was running out of space basically. I started using screen space for code, so I reduced the play area so I could have a few more bytes for my code. I found out reducing it down to 10 by 10, by 10 actually worked pretty fine. And uh, so when we started on Rogue 64 we kept it that way. And uh, then we were able to have the map on the right hand side and have all the stats on the left hand side and put all the information on the screen at the same time. Which worked out uh, pretty well actually. The last few years the C64 has been blessed with many games in the genre. From the awesome Katabatia to Trogue 64 and it's fun seeing the genre's revival. On a system these kind of games had some of their first releases back in the early 80s. I asked Ricky about how this game came to be and the choice to make a roguelike. Rogue 64 is based on a rogue uh, like game that we made for the uh, Cassette 50 charity competition called Rogue 4K. In that competition you had to make a game that was less than 4 kilobytes and uh, I thought it would be interesting to try and make a roguelike in 4 kilobytes because then you have when you do a procedural generation and it's easy to make more content even though you have quite a few memory uh, restrictions. The game ended up being uh, less than 4k but over 2k of the code was actually just the dungeon generation algorithm. Uh, the game got the fourth place in the uh, competition and I really liked making it and I loved the, the way the algorithm worked so when I was finished with the game I thought that uh, this has a bit of potential so it would be cool to try and explore what kind of game we can make if we actually explore the, or use the full potential of the uh, Commodore 64. There are many things to like here. The simple but detailed graphic style, which really appeals to me. It makes me think of classic games like Temple of Apshai, for example. The music is particularly good, really taking advantage of the SID chip, with a long, modern sounding, haunting yet toe tapping tune, complete with sound effects for added atmosphere. It's really good. The automapped feature on the right is also pretty impressive, and it helps eliminate the use for good old pen and paper. But my favorite aspect of this game is that when creatures die, they don't respawn. Kill everything in a level and you're free to explore unhindered, which is an aspect of these games which is always annoying, especially in large scale areas. I was curious though as to how long the team had been working on this game for. We started work on Rogue 64 after the uh, Cassette 50 charity competition was uh, finished, so I guess it was around beginning of April. And then I had a bit of a pause between June and September last year, and then continued until now uh, January. So it's, yeah, it's been on and off, I guess, about six months of my evenings. Overall, Rogue 64 is another great game in the genre on the C64. It's one more try addictiveness really shines through, and is an easy for anyone to get into game and understand quickly. It also comes with a built-in instruction manual in-game for any more information nuances. It's available now digitally in the CRT format for use in VAS and the C64 Mini and Max and Bitmap Soft has just released these gorgeous physical cartridge versions as well and I'll leave links in the description to both the physical order and the digital download. And I asked Ricky one more question about if they got any more upcoming C64 projects in the works and he said We have started on another Commodore 64 game, can't really tell you much about it. It's gonna be a, another kind of a, like a party game, multiplayer party game like uh, Showdown Wars, maybe a little bit simpler than the Rogue uh, 64. I'm also looking into uh, Amiga stuff because I used to be active in the, uh, the old uh, Amiga demo scene so we'll see I'm not sure about it yet are we gonna, we're probably gonna make another Commodore 64 game this year maybe at least start on an Amiga game as well and that's Rogue 64 take the plunge it's well worth your time number 56 Shadow Switcher was released in 2018 on the Commodore 64 by developer Dr. Woro Industries. This game is highly addictive, fast paced platformer where you simply have to collect all the rings in a room to exit. You can avoid the robots by using your handy Shadow Switcher technique where you switch places with your own shadow to escape death. It's a very clever and well made game that plays excellently. Features 40 levels in total plus a level editor, has crisp high res graphics and a thumping tune to bop your head to. Sometimes simplicity is all you need. Number 55 Monstro Giganto, released through RGCD, is another great C64 release from the Pirates of Zanzibar, the same team that gave us 2020's excellent puzzle game, Boxy Moxie. This release falls in the category of fighting game or one-on-one -on -one versus, which is a genre of game on the C64 that no one's attempted to make in a really long time, so it's nice to see a new game on the Commodore that isn't a basic platformer or puzzle ROM for a change. And although this is a fighting game, it's very unique in many ways. 
ways. First off, the style of setting is just fantastic. I'm a big fan of Japanese kaiju or monster movies, so seeing this for the first time on my C64 just blew my mind. I had the fortune to talk to Antonio Savona, one of the leads in the team that is making this game, about the style and who came up with it. Lobo came up with the idea of a Petsky based brawler last summer, inspired by a series of drawings based on Godzilla, King Kong and other giant beasts. It was initially planned as a comic book in which an army of monsters duke it out, but then one thing led to another and the project ended up being a game instead. Oh, and yes, we're all big kaiju fans here. Seeing these big monsters on screen and battling out is such a joy. The game offers a one or two player versus experience. In the one player mode you get to choose your creature from a selection of four giant beasts, each with their own unique skills and weaknesses. Just like any fighting game you should try them all out until you find the one or ones that work for you, as they all play vastly different. I asked Antonio if he could tell us a bit about the team that put this all together and how it came to be. It's basically the same team that developed Boxy Moxie, and much like Boxy Moxie, Lobo had most of the graphics done by the time he reached out to me for coding the game and to Waldo Kuma for the music. And we work very well together, therefore it's only natural that we don't change the team. The gameplay is very precise and it's definitely not a button masher. It's quite tactical, similar to the way of the Exploding Fist or International Karate, where a well-timed strike is how you play the game. Your monsters also get fatigued if you constantly button mash or attack, which leads them to getting dizzy and leaving them open to attack from your opponent. Learning the strike distance of your monster is key to success. The game is really quite fun in single player, but two players where it really shines in my opinion. I asked Antonio if it was always intended as a two player game first and a single second, or both. Yeah, this was an designed to be a party game so two players only but then once I saw the graphics I liked it so much that I thought I wanted to do something more with it so now you have one player mode the secret origins the additional monster that you can unlock and everything else that said I would agree that two player mode is where the game really shines I've been playing with my friends for quite some time now and it's still a lot of fun the basic gameplay is destroy as many monsters as you can until you die the amount of wins will put you in the Hall of Fame and if you purchase the physical card version your stats will be saved as well as any secrets you open. These secrets involve a new monster and the origin stories of many of the characters. These short little videos are full voice narration explaining the origins of each character and are quite excellent. The tale of Ai Ai of Poughkeepsie. The medicine men of Poughkeepsie kept fending off evil with a mystical eye beast for centuries. But the last shaman died during the summoning and I, I was left wandering the plains ever since, growing to a monstrous size. And are definitely well worth playing to unlock. As I'm sure you've noticed, the entire game is done in Petsky style graphics, which is not a common choice, especially in a fighting game. I asked Antonio why they chose this style over the traditional C64 graphics. That was Lobo's idea, and I think that he just liked the challenge of making uh, an entire game in Petsky, as if Commodore 64's limitations weren't enough already. From a coding perspective, uh, not being able to use sprites means that you have to adopt a new coding style to move objects on screen, but I wouldn't say it's been more or less difficult than the other games that I've coded, just a bit different. Sound is another big factor in the game with all the tunes by Aldo Chiamo which bop along at a good pace. And I love that each monster gets its own theme tune. It reminds me of when they used to do that in movies before the industry forgot that that was a thing. What's truly impressive though is the crazy amount of digital speech jammed into this game. It honestly sounds like you're playing an auntie's arcade game. Round one. I asked Antonio if this is the reason the game is only getting a cart and digital release. It's more the other way around really. Uh, the publisher, RGCD, works exclusively with cartridges. Now, I know there's so much more that you can do with the extra resources when you roll out um, a cassette version for it. And once the game was complete, uh, even with all the in-game speech that was already there, which was already a lot, the cart was still only some 20% full, give or take. Now, I didn't want to add more in-game speech because um, as much as I like talking games, I think that speech should not be invasive or prominent, but rather something to complement the action. So we came up with this idea of the secret origins of the monsters. And all in all, I think that's roughly three minutes worth of digitized speech. And it could have been easily more than that, 
but we literally run out of things to say. Overall I had a great time with this game, both in single and two player versus. Even with the unlockables in single player, it's going to have a limited shelf life, but as a two player romp with a friend, I'd highly recommend this. You can get both a digital version and physical cartridge version that comes in this awesome box with one of the best most detailed manuals I've seen in ages, both from RGCD, and I'll leave a link in the description to pick them up. Overall though, it's a new game in an old genre, on an old system, in a new style. What's not to like? Game over. Number 54. Fortress of Nazod, originally released on the Vetrex way back in 1983 by publisher Milton Bradley. This was essentially a fixed screen shooter where you had to shoot your way up a mountain in your hovercraft to reach the summit and destroy the Mystic Hurler. It's a fun addictive game and is one of the system's best releases. Fortress of Nazod finally got a port to the Commodore 64 in 2009 making it no longer a Vetrex exclusive. The conversion was done by the team of Paisaluli on graphics and coding and Linus on music and sound effects, and they really take this game to the next level. At the heart of it, they keep it the same, with its excellent 80s styled vector graphics replaced perfectly on the C64, and the sound effects sounding very close to the Vetrex original. But the inclusion of the massive thumping line of SID tracks are what take the game up a few notches, and I'm glad they took advantage of one of the C64's most powerful aspects. Playing the game is pure and utter joy. It's a cross between Space Invaders and Breakout, as you blast enemies making their way towards you. Unique features like being able to move around the entire screen in your hovercraft and using the bullet ricochet effects to help take out enemies or add to its quick thinking strategy. But just be aware your bullets can become your enemies as they can bounce back and kill you. You face off against multiple waves of enemies before advancing up the mountain with new bad guys introduced all the time, with tarantulas, gauls, birds and the boss himself, the magic hurler. It's a pretty unique game on the C64 and definitely stands out with its look and unorthodox approach to the fixed screen shooter tropes. The game actually got an official release in 2012 on the C64 in cartridge format through RGCD, but alas it's no longer available. But I'll leave links in the description to the digital version of the game, so go ahead and enjoy. Number 53. Karen and the Tangled Tentacles was originally released in 2015 on the C64 by Prior Art, but also received an updated edition in 2018, which is what you're looking at here. It's an excellent point and click style adventure game in the classic LucasArts style. You play Karen as she slowly starts to discover a massive conspiracy at the institute she works for. It's a gorgeous looking and playing game using a simple interface and features logical puzzles and a very well written story. It's not too long, but the adventure is well worth exploring. Yeah, I was hoping that some other modern C64 developer will take up the challenge and give us a massive new C64 point and click in the Zack McCracken style sometime in the future. Number 52 with such a massive library of games and game styles, the C64 never actually received a port of Bomberman, or many clones for that matter. A late 1992 C64 game release called Bug Bomber by Kingsoft was probably the closest the system ever got to a Bomberman style game, at least during the system's 1982 to 1993 original period. But that all changed in 2013 when Bomberland 64 was released by RGCD. This game is obviously a well-crafted ode to Bomberman and not really the original, but some of the more later ones in the series, which added the elaborate multiplayer aspects and much more chaotic action. Gameplay is the same as I talked about earlier, with the biggest difference being the pace, and it being even more in the style of a foster paced arcade game. It still has all the wacky power-ups like speed and bomb radius, and a multitude of massive, very cool boss battles as well. Being based on later Bomberman games means not only do you get an excellent 36 level single player experience with its Full own story, but you also get all those fun multiplayer death matches from the more chaotic titles like Saturn Bomberman. The death matches also support two to five players with the help of ProtoVision's four player adapter that works with the original C64. It's always very cool to see such well implemented support for this peripheral. This game is excellent on all fronts, from its high res detailed graphics 
awesome pumping SID music, the excellent single and multiplayer options, and of course TARC responsive controls. I think coder Mikhail Okawiki did a stellar job that was apparently 10 years in the making. This game is also free as a digital download from RGCD and I'll leave a link to their site. It's also available in this excellent physical version on cartridge with a ton of extras. Currently as of making this it's sold out but maybe some new stock will be produced. Overall even if you're not a fan of Bomberman's multiplayer aspects this version's single player experience is a great treat for anyone wanting a fun easy to get into arcade romp. Number 51 BOFH Servers Under Siege is another crazy action game from Covert Bit Ops and that maniac programmer Lasse Orni and was released in 2002. It's a top down action game that almost feels like an adaptation of the movie Die Hard with the action taking place on a six story skyscraper with a bunch of dodgy activists taking over the building and taking control of the servers and workstations. You arrive to work and basically go into rage mode and decide to take out all the activists by any means necessary. You can beat them up and take their weapons with tons of cool options like shotguns, handguns and even flamethrowers. It gets really crazy. Not only do you have to deal with these hooligans but also defuse all the bombs all over the building as you fight your way up to the server room on the 6th floor. You also pick up key cards which give you clues as to how to defuse the bombs without blowing yourself up. The controls take a little bit getting used to but after a few minutes it's easy enough with fast paced action, good graphics and really cool sound effects and music. It's a fun game to explore and unique with maybe only Crackdown being the only comparison, although this is way better, faster and much more satisfying. Number 50 International Karate Ultimate is a 2018 remix by John Egg of 1986's One on One vs Beat 'Em Up International Karate by System 3. This version retains all the original's excellent gameplay and options and adds a nice new title screen, features all new backdrops from all over the world and has a remix of Rob Hubbard's excellent music score. It gives a classic game a nice modern C64 overhaul and if you enjoyed the original then this is just a wonderful homage to it. Number 49 Zeta Wing was released in September 2020 through Protovision. It's a fantastic vertical scrolling shoot 'em up on the Commodore 64 by Sarah Jane Avery, who gave us 2019's Neutron, which is basically the precursor to this great shooter. Check out my top 10 2019 release Commodore 64 games for more info on that one. This game is a throwback to old style arcade games from the 80s and early 90s, especially the arcade shooter Gemini Wing by Tecmo, which Sarah says was the inspiration for Zeta Wing. You can definitely see it in the creature and level design and it's a great ode to that game which incidentally Sarah was also part of the same team in 1989 that converted Gemini Wing to the Amiga. And back to Zeta which has seven stages in total with three difficulty settings making it easy for people that find shoot 'em ups difficult to have a good time. The first thing I loved about this was the bouncy fun music. It's instantly likeable and brought a smile to my face as it reminded me a lot of shooters like Fantasy Zone and Parodius. All the music, graphics and programming were done by Sarah herself making this game one of those classic one man or <laughs> one woman shows. The game flows extremely well with a simple to understand weapons upgrade system and a player friendly way of dealing with hits. Meaning if you take a stray bullet you will only lose one level of your upgraded weapons so you never left stranded with zero upgrades on the hardest part of a level. The graphics are great with tons of awesome parallax scrolling and well animated enemies and bosses. I also love the variety in the levels. It's not just one of those kind of space shooters where it's the same scenery over and over again. Each level has its own look and cool tricky bosses to overcome. Sarah describes herself as a full time game program and part time writer, which she is the author of the Briley Witch novels, which she is currently making into an RPG on the Commodore 64. As a programmer you can definitely see where she got the skills to make such a fantastic shoot em up. The combination of the Gemini wing conversion, plus she also worked on two excellent core design shooters on the Mega CD slash Sega CD, namely the brilliant 
Soulstar and Thunderstrike. Overall, I loved it. It plays really, really well. It doesn't feel cheap. You always get a little bit further each time. The graphics and sound are both top-notch quality. Also of special note, if you downloaded this game in the first day or two of release, just make sure you download the new version as of making this, as it adds a savable high score table to the game for some added replay value. The full soundtrack for the game has also been uploaded to YouTube by Sarah herself, and the game is available as a digital download for the C64 and works with original hardware, Mini, Maxi and Vass. All links are available in the video description. This is just a cool shooter done with a ton of passion for the genre. Number 48 you Have to Win the Game was released in 2012, converted to the C64 by Kabuto, a remake of a PC game, done with that same CGA graphic style, and it's really glorious to look at on the Commodore 64. It's a beautiful looking action puzzle platformer, where you have to collect four glowing orbs and make it through this death trap labyrinth to win the game. It's simple and features an awesome graphic style, but only lacks really a nice C64 SID track to complement it, but besides that, it's an excellent addition to the C64's new wave modern legacy. Number 47 Attack of the Petski Robots was released in 2021 by 8-Bit Productions, and this is the enhanced C64 version that improves the graphics and adds an awesome soundtrack as well. It's a top-down action strategy game from David Murray set in the future, where robots have taken over everything. You have to infiltrate their bases and destroy them, while using a multitude of items and gadgets to wipe them out. It's fast-paced and addictive, and very well designed. This version is using a combination of C64 sprite work and pet ski graphics and looks pretty cool and definitely offers a really good challenge and is also available in physical form and an enhanced Commodore 128 version which is exceptionally good. Number 46 the Age of Heroes was released in the first quarter of 2019 by Cytronic Software for the C64. I've been keeping tabs on this game for a while now, ever since I first found out it was by the same team that did Organism, another fantastic little C64 game. With Akim Volkers on programming duties, Trevor Story on graphics and design, and Soul Cross on music and sound effects, you know this is going to be something special. The story is you have to gather a bunch of stones to get rid of some evil in the land, you know your usual fantasy nonsense backstory. It's pretty much on par with Rastan's throwaway plot. As you can probably see though, this game is very much inspired by Rastan, particularly the C64 version, but oh does it do it a thousand times better. Just like the Rastan arcade, this is a scrolling hack and slash with the ability to pick up weapons and smart bombs and kill all manner of beasts and bosses. There are 15 levels to play through, and you can access them from a map and tackle them in all different orders, although your path will eventually be blocked if you haven't found the stones for completing the levels, which gives you access to new areas. The best part about this game is that you can backtrack and replay any level again which really helps you upgrade your character. As the game employs some light RPG elements, the more beasts you kill the stronger you get as you level up. So replaying older levels is key. Visually I think the stages are really varied and look really good. I love that they are not too long and don't overstay their welcome. Taking out the giant head bosses gives you access to better weapons like a giant axe or improved sword. There is a massive variety in monsters you can fight and each one can be taken out in different ways. The game feels really good and is not slow and clunky like the original C64 last hand, but moves briskly and handles quite well. There are also some really nice fantasy-esque tunes to be heard throughout the game. The game is also generally pretty easy which makes it way more accessible to the average gamer. Also make sure to check out the excellent music demo that's also included in the game. Number 45 Endless Forms Most Beautiful was a game for me at least that felt like it came out of nowhere, but damn did it impress the hell out of me. I didn't know its history being a 2012 ZX Spectrum game and then getting a PC remake that same year which this C64 version is based on. The game is an arcade platform game that is another great throwback to classic arcade style quick gameplay. It reminds me a bit of Bomberman and other great 80s throwbacks. You have to rescue these little M characters while avoiding the enemy or just blowing them up with your bombs. 
drums while trying not to blow yourself up. Good luck with that. The game was coded by Ricky B80 and he did a wonderful job with this conversion. And like many games on this list, it sports the C64's high res look, which a lot of modern games are using and it looks quite fantastic. The intro music track is brilliant, as is the in-game tracks, which are Sid renditions of classic rock music, like Aerosmith's Walk This Way for example, which are very cool and are done really well by Sid composer NM156. Another great little arcade title to add to your C64 list. Number 44 Luftrauser Z made its debut on the C64 in 2017 by programmer Paul Kohler and was released physically by RGCD. This shoot 'em up is based on the 2014 indie PC game Luftrauser and is a fast paced CD or Pans shoot 'em up arcade style action game where you take out hordes of fighter planes, massive battleships, and other ace pilots in over 60 different missions. The game features over 100 combinations of plane and weapon upgrades as you blast your way up the leaderboard to become the ultimate ace pilot. This is one of those new styled C64 games that brings a modern look to the old bread box with its vibrant stylish reds, yellows and whites to make a C64 game that looks like no other. The game is extremely fast paced and it's going to take a little bit of time to get used to but once you get the flow of it it's an amazing experience and has an absolutely loud rocking SID track to accompany the action. Just bear in mind this game is in PAL format only and does not run on NTSC system. But if you're playing it through emulation it should be no problem. So if you're looking for a unique modern style shoot 'em up on your C64 then look no further. Number 43 Polar Bear in Space was originally released in 2021 on the Commodore 64 by Cytronic Software and RGCD. It's a shoot 'em up slash platform action game made almost entirely by one man, Sylvan Reinhold, with a little help from John Wells on music. The version of the game I'm looking at today is the updated 2022 version, which is about to get a new physical run on Cytronic as of making this, so look out for that if the game interests you. I was lucky enough to interview Sylvan for this video and get his thoughts on the game and I'll let him introduce himself. Hi, I'm Sylvan Reinhold. I designed and wrote Polar Bear in Space, did all the game design, programming, graphics and sound. Since I'm not a musician, I was fortunate enough to also work with John Wells who contributed the music and my very good friend Dina Smith assisted with game design, marketing strategy and the concept for the video trailer. The game's story has you as a polar bear lost in space as you come across an alien space station and find out it has a transporter that can send you home. The only caveat is you have to collect 99 crystals to activate it. Thus, you have to blast and platform your way around the station, collecting them while surviving alien attacks and all the traps protecting the base. I asked Sylvan how long it took to put the whole game together. Polar Bear in Space took about three years from start to finish and that was between December 2018 and December 2021 and just like probably most retro game development these days that was not full time but mostly done whenever there was free time to spare really. I went back and forth quite a bit deciding on game and visual design direction so that went through something like three or four iterations and also optimizing everything to make sure the game runs smoothly and fits into memory. What probably took the most effort overall though was the last 20% of the process trying to make sure everything worked as a coherent unit and then there was the video and the user manual and the publishing process also took a good chunk of time during that last year as well. The basic gameplay has you blasting incoming aliens, collecting supplies as you search for terminals which you have to hack to gain access into the inner facilities and sends the game into a platform style affair as you try to retrieve all the crystals in the area. The game is a really great blend of two distinct gameplay styles, a drop zone style shoot 'em up and a more traditional style platformer. I asked Sylvan if there was any particular games that were influences on Polar Bear's design. The two main influences for Polar Bear in Space were Drop Zone and Whizball. Love both of those games, played them a lot back in the day and I enjoyed them not just for the game design, but also for the technical aspects. Matter of fact, the first piece of code I wrote for PBIS was the explosion sequence, and that was quite heavily inspired by the one in Drop Zone. Uh, but that was clearly before I decided that the main character had to be a polar bear. I'd actually planned something more like R-Type or Armalite as far as gameplay, but then I also wanted to add some platform elements. So that's really where the bear came in. So now you have a polar bear that's in space and explodes. 
footage here is from both the original version and the newer updated one, which Sylvan did after player feedback and reviews of the game. A host of improvements have been implemented, the most notable being bearable mode. As you can see here, it improves many aspects that make the game much easier to play, and makes this way more fun and accessible. I played the original version in 2021 and was put off a bit by the difficulty, which made it very frustrating. It's still no walk in the park though, but it's now something I'd totally recommend, especially to fans of Whizball or Drop Zone. And I asked Sylvan his personal reasons for this new version. A lot of that was based on feedback I got since the initial release. Most of it was actually very positive and it was nice to see some of the great reviews the game received too. And as long as you're prepared to not take things too personally, you can get a lot out of the comments folks post online about your work as well. There were also a few challenges I saw people having based on playthrough videos they posted online, and the other half was me changing some of my own perspective on my work with a bit more distance. And it also took a while for the cart release to be feasible in the first place, so I figured it'd be a great opportunity to make some adjustments and additions to the game while waiting. The bearable mode is just the tip of the iceberg with many other modifications which you can take a look at on the Sartronic Software site for the full rundown. I personally have enjoyed playing this game quite a lot compared to the original version. It's no secret I love games with multiple gameplay styles, that's always a bonus for me, especially when it comes to retro games. I asked Sylvan about the challenges he faced while bringing this game to fruition. The biggest challenge was mostly trying to fit the entire game into the available 64k of the machine. That's something you really have to think about when you add features. And then I wanted to include a real ending sequence too, so that's when you gradually notice you're running out of memory and you start trying to find ways to optimize all that. For example, the game does a lot of data decompression on the fly, and that probably made the most significant difference as far as memory. Performance was another challenge, trying to keep the frame rate up with everything that needs to happen on the screen. And the particle system for the explosion sequence is maybe also not the most trivial thing you'd ever do in assembly language. So. These things really start adding up pretty quickly, but they're all nice challenges to have. Overall, the graphics are excellent, small and detailed, with a great metallic style look and spot effects. It's not only visually appealing in the shooter sections, but the platform parts are wonderful as well. John Wells provides the music and delivers like he always does, with some epic Martin Galway inspired tunes that sit extremely well with the feel of the game. It's also much easier and way less fiddly to control, which is obviously very welcome. Out of curiosity, I asked Sylvan one last question, how he got his start in programming on the Commodore 64. We got a Commodore 64 as a first computer when I was still in elementary school and at that time I got all the books and magazines I could to teach myself basic and assembly language too. I might have started working on a game or two back in those days as well but I never finished any of them and that was partly also because it was pretty tedious to write anything directly on a C64. And at that time there was also no internet or cell phone so as a child you actually got to play outside a lot. And now just a few years back in 2018 I finally decided to write and actually complete a full game and here we are. And that's it. Polar Bear and Space is available in the new limited white cartridge version. Digital as well for mini maxi and emulation use and only works on PAL systems, so bear that in mind. It's another great modern C64 game I'd highly recommend and links in the description to Cytronic Software. So go and have yourself a real blast. Number 42. The Isle of the Cursed Prophet was released in 2020 and developed by the team Icon64 and distributed by Cytronic Software. The game falls into the action-adventure genre even though it resembles an RPG. It's way more Legend of Zelda than Ultima though. The game's story sees your character embarking on a quest to resurrect his dead wife. He believes the answers and solution to his situation lie on the Cursed Isle. Thus, the quest begins. The gameplay involves lots of exploration, light puzzle solving and tons of action. Your character levels up after a number of kills giving you more health in the process. Keys can be found to open towers and other structures as you search this massive open world island. The graphics are really good employing some nice high res characters and foes, with the intro to the game being particularly excellent, really setting the tone and atmosphere up well. The music is somber and dark and feels right at home as you search this creepy island, with Jason Page and Soul Cross on audio. The rest of the Archon 64 guys are also on hand with Age of Heroes coder Akim Volkers and Rocky Memphis designer Trevor Story all contributing to this excellent little game. It is both NTSC and PAL compatible and available in digital and physical forms. And links to this are in the video description to another excellent Icon 64 release. Number 41 
Pains and Aches was released in 2018 by Cytronic Software and is the sequel to the excellent 2019 game Knights and Grail, which we'll look at later on this list, and continues the story right after the original ends. It mixes arcade action, platforming, puzzles and story into an excellent metroidvania styled affair on the c64. You got an auto map of the castle, upgrades to your character, people to talk to and another excellent music score just like the original. The graphics are varied and sublime, it's both NTSC and PAL compatible and was released physically and is another wonderful high production new wave release. Number 40 Super Mario Bros. was released on the C64 in 2019 by Zero Page, a conversion of the NES platformer, unofficially of course. It's a brilliant remake that captures the looks and sounds of the original quite excellently with spot on gameplay and really good renditions of the NES tunes, plus graphics that look almost identical to the original. It's not as impressive as the Sonic Master System conversion, but still, it's great to be able to play this NES classic on the old bread box. Number 39 Metal Warrior 4 Agents of Metal was designed by Covert Bitops and released in 2003 and is another epic action adventure game following on directly from the events of the third game. It has the same basic gameplay elements with character interactions and dialogue choices, upgradable armor and a plethora of cool weapons to play with. This entry also has a much needed difficulty setting and is also way more balanced and much more fun than the brutally difficult third entry. This game's story takes a cool science fiction twist and is one of the highlights of the series in terms of storytelling and all the really cool environments and locations to explore with lots of new moves, more interactive indoor and outdoor environments and even a stealth system which rewards non-lethal takedowns. It has fantastic presentation and music as always from Lasse Orne and I definitely suggest picking up the physical or digital version of Metal Warrior Quadrilogy from Cytronic as the best way to play this series in its entirety. We interrupt our program to bring you this important message. And we'll stop this video again and show a couple more really great honorable mentions. Ghost Bunny is a cute 2021 release that mixes high res graphics, simple exploring and arcade style action in a small addictive package. Yum 64 is a visually impressive 3D styled modern trailblazer game from 2018 released by RGCD. Soulless is a very cool Cytronic release from 2012 and is an ode to 1988's Draconis. It's a slick platform adventure that also received an excellent updated version. Super Breadbox is a 2013 conversion of a PC platform shoot 'em up and it is just tons of super fun chaos on screen and is a pretty unique game for a C64 release. Mindstorm is another unofficial Vetrex port of a game that's a cool variation on the arcade game Asteroids. Cannabolt is a 2011 unofficial conversion by Andreas Varga and is one of the C64's best endless runners with cool tunes and animation. Darkness is a 2014 Cytronic release and feels like a modern C64 version of the classic Sabre Wolf. Guns and Ghosts is a 2013 Cytronic release and is an excellent single screen shooter with a great two player mode and some rocking music. Hell Beneath is a super fun simple twin stick style shooter that's a spin off of sorts of Haplo's Tenabra series. And lastly is Old Tower which is a very cool 2020 puzzle action hybrid game with very detailed graphics and some excellent music and is another unique title on the C64. Number 38 Planet Golf was released in 2017 by RGCD and Cytronic Software and coded by Antonio Savona. It's a crazy fun game that's a variation on golf allowing you to play on all different planets with completely different gravity in single screens to try sync the ball. This game is just oozing with production values and presentation, high res graphics 
and excellent music tracks by Aldo and Gatano Kumo, a must-play game that mixes arcade and light puzzle elements together absolutely sublimely. Number 37 Muddy Races was released in December 2022 by Protoversion and is the first game on this list by coder and graphics artist Monty Boyd. Muddy Races is a fast-paced up to four players top-down racer similar in style to the old arcade games by Leland Corporation such as Super Offroad and Indie Heat. It has single race modes to jam about against friends and a full championship mode with 18 different tracks in total spread across three different environments from mud, forest and snow. The game features cool drift mechanics as you take corners, ramps to boost you over gaps and money to pick up along the way which can help you upgrade your car between races. The addition of being able to drop oil and turbo boost just adds to the party nature of the game leading to all sorts of chaos on screen. This is a fantastic release by Protovision which has support for their 4 player adapter and the game is PAL and NTSC compatible. The graphics and personality really shine through in this game and is another wonderful C64 release by Monty Boyd which also sports some rocking SID tracks by Jammer which is just excellent. The game is available in physical and digital versions from Protovision so definitely support this awesome C64 developer. Number 36 As you can see, the group Mega Style made up of Chris Stanley on programming, Ruin Spans on graphics, and Roy Whitting on music have spared no expense in this brilliant remake of The Empire Strikes Back, now on the Commodore 64 for the first time in its original version. The game is pretty much overall the same, but is loaded with details and extra touches to make it the ultimate 8-bit version currently available. The biggest problem with the original was that it had no ending or winnable situations. You would eventually die no matter what you did. Megastyle have now broken this game down into 8 stages and have added a variety of extra vehicles to destroy to mix up the gameplay. The stages flip through AT-ATs and AT-STs as the main vehicles with droid extras and the game cycles through the day as it goes from morning to night as each stage is complete. A transport escapes half until Luke escapes himself at the end of level 8. The game obviously ends if all your ships are lost or the Empire destroys the power generators. Attacking them as quickly and as efficiently as possible and adjusting your speed for maximum blasting while still dodging incoming fire. It's a mad balancing act that's a lot of fun and with all the attention to detail in the graphics such as the damage seen on the AT-ATs as you pummel them with blaster fire, the cool parallax scrolling effects. The nice addition of little cutscenes between levels, plus the cool title screen with its arcade style splash screen giving you details about the gameplay. This project is clearly a labor of love by the whole team. The music is fantastic as well as all the Empire Strikes Back movie themes have been faithfully recreated in glorious SID form and they complement the game very well making it feel like a genuine official Star Wars product. The game is currently available on Megastyle's itch page for free with optional donations going to charity. I I love seeing these Atari 2600 games get C64 facelifts in the modern era and this is another prime example of this concept working brilliantly. Number 35 Rocky and Company was released in October of 2023 by Cytronic Software on the C64, another wonderfully crafted game by the team, Archon 64. Made up of Stuart Collier on programming, Trevor Story on design and graphics, and Soul Cross on music, they have been a staple of the C64 modern gaming scene, giving us real high production releases for many years now, including Isle of the Cursed Prophet the soulless games and Age of Heroes plus so so much more. Like all Archon 64 games they take a classic C64 release, in this case Datasoft's 1985 game The Goonies and use that as inspiration to make a game in a similar mold. Rocky & Co is also a sequel to one of the older games Rocky Memphis The Legend of Atlantis which features the same character Rocky the Indiana Jones style adventurer. That was a side on action puzzle platformer but just in a completely different style. In this one you control three characters at the same time, switching to them on the fly to help solve all the puzzles and circumvent all the traps to make it past each stage. Your goal is to find the legendary Golden Condor statue. Each of the 12 stages are single screen affairs where you have to solve multiple puzzles to be able to get all three of your members of the party to the exit safely. Rocky has average speed but he has a whip and is the only one that can kill creatures like bats and snakes. Spud is slow but can push and use heavy objects and Jet is super fast and can jump fast 
far, which is useful for those rolling rock segments and platformer parts. Combining and switching between these three characters is how you solve the puzzles and traverse the traps. What I like is that you can play this game in normal mode where lives apply and will grant you an end sequence, but you can also play it in practice mode that lets you go through the entire game with infinite lives but you get no ending and is a good way to suss out each stage. Also in this mode you don't have access to the secret bonus level. The team has done another wonderful great job here. The graphics are definitely in the Goonies style, just way more colourful and detailed. The music by Soul Cross is very fun and peppy and the gameplay is very good. A few deaths were the result of the switching mechanic which can be a little bit clunky but after a while it becomes fairly intuitive. I'm glad I got to review this game though a good few weeks after its initial release as a multitude of fixes and updates were added by Mark Robertson including multiple different file formats to work on all different emulators, saving to a physical cartridge and the option for multi-button controllers allowing you to simply use a button to switch characters. If you're watching this video and downloading it later just make sure you get the latest version. As per usual with Archon games it's both NTSC and PAL compatible, works on all emulators including the Mini and the Maxi and I'll leave links in the video description to purchase the game from Cytronic in both digital and full box cartridge format. It's another top quality Archon production and as per usual I'm always waiting eagerly to see what they're going to put out next. Number 34 Doc Cosmos The Saga Begins was released on the C64 in 2019 by Simon Jameson as part of the RGCD 16K cartridge competition. This is another clever platform action puzzle adventure that uses a cool switch mechanic like Shadow Switcher as its gameplay mechanic. You play Doc Cosmos as you're trying to steal an alien time travel device but get stuck in the underground facility but you can now use the device to switch back and forth in time to solve puzzles and progress. The game has 47 screens and you can time that by 2 with the 2 different timelines. Regular C64 graphics are used for the current time and the alternate past it uses a pet ski style. It's done quite brilliantly. Nice music, clever use of time travel to solve puzzles and a fun game that deserves way more recognition in the new wave C64 scene. Number 33 Yes, 2014 was finally the year the wait was over. 32 years after its initial arcade release, we finally got to see an unofficial port of Donkey Kong Jr. on the Commodore 64. The game was headed up by Austrian programmer, musician and graphic artist Andreas Varga, who was also known as Mr. Sid in the C64 demo and music scene, with Mikhail Hestrup on music and Steve Day sharing graphic duties with Varga. This also happens to be most of the same team responsible for another brilliant 22 years later unofficial port of Prince of Persia also to the C64 in 2011. As far as an arcade port goes, I'd say this is probably the best 8-bit version of Donkey Kong Jr. out there. From the awesome loader title screen to the excellent well animated and colourful graphics that take full advantage of the C64, they really managed to get the look and feel of the game very close to the original. In fact, if it wasn't for the missing little intermission screens between levels, it would be almost a perfect port, with all four levels recreated excellently. The best part about the port for me is the included difficulty settings, which finally makes this game playable for mere humans. And the much improved sound of the little musical scores is also quite a nice touch. Not only did they do an exceptional port of this game, but personally I actually enjoyed this version way more than any other one I've ever played and for that I think it's a total success. Number 32 2015 was a year the group Nostalgia released their redo of the 1985 version of Commando and try to make it a much closer version of the arcade than the original was. If you don't know who Nostalgia is, it's a C64 cracking group that cracks games and makes awesome demos for the C64 demo scene community and they were formed by Zyron and Mr. Alpha in 1995 and are also responsible for the excellent redo of Ghosts and Goblins which I'll feature in a future episode. So what makes this C64 version so good compared to the already well done original? Well let's start with the fact that they now have all 8 levels from the arcade intact. A brilliant new title screen, tons of in-game graphical enhancements such as the helicopter from the original arcade version and they've sorted out the slowdown and most importantly they have mapped the grenades to a longer press of the fire button, who dares wins 2 style, making the game much easier to control. Naturally also being a cracking group we've got an excellent selection of built in cheats for you to use or ignore at your whim. It's quite an amazing job they have done here and it really is an impressive upgrade. Now the only thing they did wrong was try to remix Rob Hubbard's original music track and that was not the best of ideas. 
it just doesn't sound right. But luckily you get the choice of the remix music or the original, so maybe even they weren't that confident in their own remix themselves. Overall though, it's a brilliant version that is a must play, and you can download it for free from the CSDB site, which I'll put a link to in the video description. Number 31 Million Molly was released in 2020 and published by Bitmap Soft and is a very clever puzzle style game where you get to control two girls Millie and Molly as you try to collect all of the teddy bears in each level and other objects later. One wrong move and the objects you need to collect will be out of reach so careful planning a few steps ahead is always needed. It starts off extremely easy but making it to the end of all 100 levels is a real brain teaser. It features C64 veterans at the helm with Colton Handley on code, Soul Cross on graphics and Hans Axelsen Savala on music giving another wonderful score just like the Nice and Grail series. On top of all this, it features modern gameplay tropes like passwords and a nifty rewind feature to undo some really major mistakes and is one of the best new wave puzzle games on the 64, available also in physical form. Number 30 Rocky Memphis The Legend of Atlantis was released by Cytronic Software in 2018 by the Archon 64 team and is a really cool action puzzle platformer that has you as Rocky Memphis, an explorer who stumbled upon the lost city of Atlantis and is now trying to find out all its secrets. It's a big game to explore with tons of traps and puzzles to figure out and features really nice high res graphics, a cool Indiana Jones inspired soundtrack from Soul Cross and is both NTSC and PAL compatible. This game also got a sequel in the form of Rocky and Company which we looked at earlier and is available from Sartronic in both physical and digital forms. Number 29 Newcomer was originally released in 1994 but we are looking at the much updated 2001 version released through Protovision in physical form. It's an adventure RPG hybrid designed by Cinematic Intuitive Dynamics who is a Hungarian team that spent 10 years making the game spread out over 8 double sided discs for a truly mammoth gaming experience. This game is one hell of a ride in the best possible way with lush cutscenes, characters to interact with and many puzzles to solve, RPG style battles to take part in and with very much non-linear gameplay with sometimes multiple solutions to situations and events. Part of the draw of this game is the story and characters without spoiling too much. You end up in a prison island after you murder your wife's lover in an epic intro sequence. But the catch is you don't remember getting here and the prison is unlike anything normal so what is really going on is the real question. Like a traditional RPG you can get characters to join your party to help you out in the adventure. Unlike most RPGs though the battles aren't random but are now part of the story gameplay elements. Upgrading skills, earning money and interacting with the over 100 unique characters will help you expand the story, solve the puzzles and immerse you in this unique world. It's a truly amazing game with sublime graphics and fantastic music and I played it completely on keyboard. It's not perfect though with disc swapping slowing things down dramatically and if you have no patience or time this is definitely not a game for you. It is also a PAL format game only but if you're playing it through emulator this is no real issue as you can simply switch between PAL and NTSC. This is one of the rare RPGs made for the C64 in the last 20 years and is also a must play for fans of this genre. Everyone else may find it too slow or cumbersome but still a truly epic achievement on the old C64 worth celebrating. Number 28 Puzzle Bobble on the C64 was released at the start of February 2022 and is a game that's been in development for a very long time. So has it been worth the wait? I'd say a resounding yes. The team of Asiad, NM156 and Hen have truly delivered a wonderful 8-bit version of Taito's classic puzzler. No shortcuts have been taken and the entire arcade experience is here in its full glory from the wonderful recreation of the Neo Geo title sequence. The game's awesome splash screen intro and all 32 levels of the arcade experience. The two player mode is also included which is something 8-bit arcade versions usually get shafted on. The attention to detail here is excellent and the game really feels almost exactly like its arcade big brother although at a slightly slower pace. The graphics by hand are extremely colorful and feel very C64-ish while still looking like their arcade counterpart. The music is an exact rendition of the arcade's main theme 
and the sound effects are absolutely spot on. Above all this, the team have included a built-in trainer menu, support for keyboard and paddle controls, and the game is available for free of course, as it's an unofficial licensed game, and works on all the modern C64 devices and original hardware. Just bear in mind it's a PAL format only game, so hopefully they'll make an update in the future for NTSC owning C64 users, because I'm sure that'll go down a storm with them. Who'd ever thought we'd be getting top quality ports of mid-90s arcade games on our beloved bread boxes in 2022? I'm not even going to question it as the C64 continues on 40 years after its original release. Number 27 Space Mogul was released in 2018 on the C64 by Protovision. Mogul is a massive tribute, or you could even consider it a modern remake of Mule from 1983, taking all the space trading, multiplayer, strategy and addictive gameplay that made it a classic and updating it with a modern visual makeover and sound design, but still running off the same hardware. And it's impressive to think that this was actually possible to produce in 1983 if the programmers of the day knew all the ins and outs that modern developers know now. Moguls like Mule can have up to four players with the help of the Protovision 4 player adapter battle it out to see who can become the richest mogul on a particular planet. You start off with minimal supplies and have to build yourself up by making food, energy, mining for materials and ore and purchasing a robot assistant who can be sent off to work the land you bought while you attend to other matters. The game takes place over rounds, which you can adjust accordingly depending on how much time you actually have in the real world. Just like Mule, everyone gets a turn to buy land, send off your robot, trade where you can sell goods or buy stuff from other players and deal with all those pesky random events that the planet throws at you. It's fun with deep strategy elements that are easy to get into and like Mule it's pretty fun against the computer but thrives even more with the human multiplayer aspect. The graphics are absolutely gorgeous with high res stylings and traditional pixel styles with excellent use of color to give each planet and scenario a completely different look and feel. The music is absolutely rocking as well with a massive variety of well-fitting long tunes that add a lot to something that could have easily just been sound effects only. The game is available from Protovision in both physical and digital forms and works on the Mini Maxi, real hardware and is also NTSC and PAL compatible. It's an excellent tribute that goes above and beyond bringing a classic to a modern C64 audience. Number 26 Zeta Wing 2 was released on the Commodore 64 at the end of April 2023 by Witchsoft, programmer and designer Sarah Jane Avery's game making brand. Zeta Wing 2 is the sequel to 2020's exclusive Commodore 64 vertically scrolling shooter, Zeta Wing. You again have to jump into your spaceship and blast your way through seven levels of bug alien infestation landscapes to take out the alien queen. If you've played vertical shoot 'em ups before and grew up in the arcade, you're gonna feel right at home here. The game delivers that very satisfying action while still being fair without murdering you in 5 seconds. The game initially feels like the original in terms of graphics and levels, but after a few stages and upon reaching the giant fortress in the sky, it really starts to step things up a notch. Upgrades work the same as the original, collecting stars boost your firepower, which there are 12 levels of, and it really starts making you feel invincible after a while, in the best possible way, almost like a 90s Topla and arcade shoot 'em up. And also if you lose a life, you only get downgraded by one level of firepower so you never get destroyed like those old Konami titles but can always go forward. A new addition here is the inclusion of a screen killing smart bomb which you can also assign to certain keys or an extra fire button. But I also like the option of being able to set it to auto meaning if you take a bullet during action it launches a bomb automatically saving your life depending on how many you have. It's a cool idea, I remember first being used in Toplan's Tiger Heli in the 1980s, at least that's what I remember it from, and I always just love this idea. The multiple difficulty settings are also well implemented and really do feel more challenging without being ridiculous. Although I will say, if you are in any way decent at shoot 'em ups, don't select easy, it's way too easy. I literally completed it on my second go, but normal is extremely well balanced and is definitely the way to go. The graphics are pretty good overall, the beginning stages do feel like remixes of the original with nice parallax action, but the later levels really do start to impress with caves, airships, 
and enemy bases all looking really smart. Plus the addition of many new enemies are introduced later on which are really visually appealing and offer up a really good challenge. Boss encounters though are the highlights for this game with each one having multiple parts and transformations, giving the game a real arcadey feel and I really enjoyed each and every encounter. The only slight complaint here really is the music and it's not because it's bad by any means, it actually complements the fun vibe of the game really well, but I feel like I've heard it all before. Slight variations on Zeta Wing 1, Briley Witch and even Soul Force. I mean I do love a main theme that is repeated various times in different tunes just like old movie soundtracks, but these feel more like tracks being repeated from other games. They all work well in context of the game, but hopefully Sarah's next game will have a nice fresh selection of original tunes. Overall though this is another shoot 'em up gem on the C64 that delivers the goods. It's both NTSC and PAL compatible and I played it on both Maxi and original hardware and it played perfectly and I'll leave links in the video description for you to download this awesome game. If you're a shoot 'em up junkie, you're gonna be well happy. Number 25 Fixit Felix Jr. was released in 2020 by Antonio Savona and team, who've already made some appearances on this list and are the same guys including Stephen Day on graphics and Soul Cross on music and sound effects who did all those excellent Atari Activision conversions to the C64 last year. And if you want to see more about that, please check out my video on the subject. As far as this game goes, it's an unofficial version of the arcade style game Fixit Felix Jr. which appears in the movie Wrecked Ralph which which is a movie about classic video game characters. I think we've come full circle. The game is a version of a Flash game made by Disney and has seen other appearances such as a Sega Genesis version as well. The gameplay is very reminiscent of early 80s arcade style games like a little bit of Donkey Kong, Alley Cat and many others where you play Felix as you attempt to fix up buildings as Ralph freaks out and destroys them. It's simple risk reward gameplay as you jump around dodging debris, birds and other hazards while fixing all the windows and collecting as many bonus items as possible. Graphics are quite excellent and capture the characters extremely well and are nice and colourful with awesome speech samples hey, you moved my stuff. and a fun music score and some excellent little cutscenes. This is just a must play game for anybody wanting to get one of those quick fix arcade experiences on the C64. Number 24. Run and Gun was released at the beginning of 2021 by Below the Tower on the Commodore 64. It's another in a long line of excellent new C64 games to grace the good old Commodore in the last decade. The game is an action platform puzzle game that takes all those elements and successfully combines them for a damn good time. I got to speak with programmer and designer of the game Carlton Handley. Hi, I'm Carlton Handley. I've been a software developer for over 30 years. I started off coding for the 64 and have recently been bitten by the Commodore bug again. Coded a few modern games for FF 8 bit computer, including Millie and Molly and Good Picks. And asked him if there was any particular older game that inspired Run and Gun. The main inspiration came from some mock up graphics Sal sent me while we were completing Millie and Molly. He wanted to know whether it would be interested in developing something off the back of them. They look great, so I was definitely in. I don't think there's any one game which is influenced in the direction the game has gone though. Just stuff I've played in the past. The Mario is probably the main inspiration, but there's also bits of Metro, Metal Slug and Contra. The story goes the two main characters, Run and Gun, get fused together in a military experiment and gone awry. Now, as a player, you can switch between them on the fly, each with their own strengths and weaknesses, as you try to stop an alien threat on the planet Bangtaya. Switching between these characters is key to success. Run is fast and can double jump but has a limited weapon range and gun is slower with no double jump but his guns more powerful and shoots further. It's a mechanic used to great effect in Colton's previous game Millie and Molly although in a different gameplay style. I asked Colton if the two main character switch mechanic is something he loves seeing in games as I feel it definitely makes gameplay more interesting. It's just a happy coincidence that there are two characters in both of the games. Sol had originally preferred the second character as someone for the player to escort and it was never our intention for them to be controlled. It's eventually transformed into the switch mechanic which I think is both more interesting and was actually easier to program. The game requires fast reflexes and nerves of steel if you want to make it all the way. Dying puts you close to where your death point was and you also get a bunch of continues so even though it is tough it's generous without making you suffer. Knowing who to use when is the biggest key to getting far. I asked Carlton how he came to collaborate with Soul Cross who does the great 
graphics and music on this game. I'd already worked with Saul on Millie Molly. That came about after I posted on Lemon asking for people to work on the new 64 game. So I responded and we went from there. Kind of switched roles with Running Gun when he sent me that map and he needed a programmer. We ended up working together again. As you can see, the graphics are really good, giving a cool NES style platformer look that looks pretty unique on the C64. The music is also another winner, with Saul providing some pumping tunes on this one, sounding a lot like his soundtrack for Alien 8, but that's a good thing. Once you start figuring out each section, the game becomes easier and easier, and veterans may find it a little short overall, although I enjoyed my time with it a lot. I asked Carlton if there are any plans to add maybe new levels or scenarios to the game later. The plan was always to release a slightly smaller game as one mission and part of a planned trilogy, but I don't think I've made this clear. I still think there's a decent amount of content, even in this one mission, that I didn't want to spend a lot of time coding something that people may not like, and the sooner people played it and fed back the better. This feedback can then be used to help improve the game going forward, and it's already helping me in the design of Mission 2. And finally, I hope that each mission would sell enough to fund development for the next one. It takes a lot of time to develop and produce something like Run and Go, and I'm currently working full time on it. So as you can probably guess, support from the 64 community is essential. It's something that has been excellent, and I thank everyone that has taken interest. The gameplay works well. There's a lot of platforming and shooting, with quick reflexes required in the later areas. It reminded me a little bit of Super Meat Boy, but no way near as annoying. You can see Carlton's skills as a level designer as each section is very cleverly put together and work well as a whole. Another feature I like is the controls are changeable. I didn't really like the standard setup and changed it to the up is jump and fire is fire method. Of course this is just my personal preference but definitely try it out first to see what works for you. And the game also features full keyboard controls and is NTSC and PAL compatible. I asked Carlton one last question, that being if he has any plans for his next game yet. Sol and I are planning on completing missions 2 and 3 over the next couple of months. I'd then really like to do something like the Game Boy Zelda game Link's Awakening. Obviously this is a huge undertaking but Sol already has some graphics he's mocked up and he's thinking of something similar. And that's Run and Gun, a fast paced shooting puzzle platform game that I thoroughly enjoyed. Check the video description for a link to purchase the game and happy platforming. Number 23. Nuts and Slams was released in August 2022 by C64 developer Monty Boyd, who also gave us the likeable C64 action game Monster Catcher that is definitely well worth playing on the C64 as well. Nuts itself is a single screen arcade platformer with you tasked as a knight of the realm to vanquish all the slams and other beasties from the kingdom. It reminds me a lot of the combination of the arcade games Bubble Bobble and Pang. If you love those two arcade games, then Nuts is going to be your cup of tea. It's not just a simple platform actioner either, as you can get to choose from up to 8 different characters and each one can be upgraded as the game progresses by collecting optional stars in each level. Every 100 points gets you one of 3 upgrades from more health, a double jump and a weapon enhancement. What's really cool is the inclusion of a save system so all your character upgrades don't go to waste, as well as a password system depending on how you play the game either through Vice, the C64 Maxi or on original hardware with a flash cart. So this all gives the game an RPG style vibe that definitely extends the replay value. In the game itself you have to destroy a set number of slimes per level before going to the next stage. You can jump on them or run into them with your sword to explode them into many smaller pieces. All the chunks have to be destroyed for a slime to die. But beware if you don't act fast two slimes of the same size can rejoin with one another and reform so speed is definitely a factor. Besides upgrades there are also various power ups that appear randomly in each level granting temporary abilities like freezing all the enemies or turning yourself into a fireball on screen for some mass distraction. The game is really big with four different worlds to explore, each containing eight levels in each. And once you complete each world, it opens up so you can select it the next time you play it from the menu. This is overall a very addictive arcade action romp with absolutely gorgeous colorful graphics, a fun little Capcom style arcade splash screen intro, and tight simple gameplay. The music is pretty good as well, although I think there needed to be a lot more of it. But thankfully there is a sound effects option if it starts to drive you a little bit mental. I had so much fun with this that I actually broke my C64 mini joystick. And I have a link in the video to download the CRT file as well as this nifty PDF instruction manual that comes with it. And please check out the full interview with Monty Boyd on our Hands On Gaming podcast also linked in the description. So what you waiting for? The slums are waiting to die. Number 22. 
Soulless 2 The Armor of Gods was released in August 2021 on the Commodore 64 by Cytronic Software. It is a sequel to Soulless, originally released in 2012, and that game also recently received a special edition version which is totally worth checking out. Soulless 2 picks up story-wise as you, King Razak, sets out to find the legendary Armor of the Gods, which gives you the ability to fly and use the Weapon of the Sun. He sets out to find it before it falls into the hands of the demented wizard Kalen. I was lucky enough to interview Trevor Story from Archon64 who did the art and game concept for Solus 2. My first question was pretty broad with the original Solus coming out almost a decade ago now. How much does he think the C64 retro scene has changed in that time? And Trevor said, there are definitely more development teams and a lot more publishers of 8-bit C64 stuff now. We also have a few dedicated C64 retro magazines with Fusion, Free64, Zap64, Italian Zap, Reset64, just to name a few. Also with the release of the C64 and the C64 Mini, a lot more people have returned to the C64 so the scene has grown quite a lot, which is great for us all. The game, like Sacred Armor of Anteria, the inspiration for this game is a combination of exploration, puzzle solving and a whole lot of action and combines them excellently for its four massive levels. You start off with nothing and have to find a gun for defense and once you gain the armor you need to upgrade the suit with guns and you also now gain the ability to fly and jump in and out of the suit to solve various puzzles and destroy enemies. My second question for Trevor was if he was a fan of the original Anteriad back in the day and he said Anteriad was a firm favorite for me and my mates when it came out. The artwork by Dan Malone was killer and the awesome title music by Richard Joseph brings back great memories. It was fantastic if short release. Each of the levels you go through has their own look and style and also focus on a different part of the gameplay element. Level 1 is all about solving puzzles. Level 2 is exploration and discovery of the suit. Level 3 is all about big enemies to fight, etc etc. It's done really well and even though you're doing a bit of everything in all the levels, they still have their own identity. Gameplay is a great mix. Simple puzzle solving like matching colors with statues to open paths to get keys. Action is really fun and fast whether it's with your gun or with the suit weapon. It's very satisfying blowing away everything and the exploration element is great. The game does come with the map if you're easily lost but I found I didn't really need it as the levels tended to be pretty logically set out. I also asked Trevor with the size of the game being pretty large I asked him how long the team had been working on this game for and he said Jorg originally wanted to do a metroidvania style game so I designed Hyperium which was pretty large. Sadly this turned into a real slog and slowly we lost interest in the project but I really wanted to do something along the lines so I simplified the design and brought it back to flip screen then it turned into Soul list too and the idea to include the armor came about. We started in 2015 and finished in 2021 with a lot of gaps in development while we did other stuff. We still managed to cram a lot into the game and it only just fit on one side of a disc. There are also plenty of secret rooms to discover that have enemies to kill who drop crowns. These crowns give you extra lives and are well worth seeking out. The Archon 64 team really delivered on this one yet again with Jorg Rottensteiner on programming, Trevor on art and concept and Soulcross on music music and sound effects. My final question I asked Trevor was how difficult was it setting up the level design as you had to get the combination of flying and walking right since most levels incorporate them. And he said I really wanted each level to feel a bit different from the last. So the first level was designed as an on foot level where you gain access to a weapon. The second level would be where you find the armor and can fly around and land. The third would have an interactive background pieces which acted as enemies and the fourth would have lots of mini bosses to fight. The final boss was made a separate load so we'd make a more interesting battle with a nice bitmap background. The room design changed as we tested so you could mostly get around on foot. The only thing we had to really think about was the amount of sprites on screen as you could exit your armor suit so we had to come up with the ways to get around the sprite limit. We also added a few rooms in the second, third and fourth levels that would randomize on each play. We had to lose the idea of saving any time as too much info needed to be saved so we went with a save on level completion instead. There's a lot of game to like here. The four levels are big and and should offer plenty of challenge to keep you going for quite a while. The graphics are a great combination of high res background and some superbly animated C64 sprite work and the look of each level is very different from the last. My only slight niggle is the music seems a little bit too sedate for this kind of adventure. Soul's tracks are good but not very memorable and there's not a single tune that I was humming after I turned off my C64. Still they are pretty atmospheric 
music and I really did like the sound effects which complemented the action really well. This game is another gem in the Huck on 64's crown and the game is both NTSC and PAL compatible and works on everything from real hardware, VAS and the C64 Mini and Maxi. It's not only an excellent homage to that Palace software classic but takes all its shortcomings and makes a truly grand fun adventure game that any C64 owner should be happy with. Number 21 Sydney Hunter and the Sacred Tribe was released in 2018 on the Commodore 64 by Collectivision Games. The Sydney Hunter series has been around since about 2012 with various other retro versions being available before this C64 port. The game follows very closely in Montezuma Revenge's shoes as it's an open world platform adventure game where you play Sydney Hunter, an adventurer exploring the Yucatan Peninsula after treasure but gets caught by a local tribe and becomes their prisoner. Help them find their mystical portal and then you'll gain your freedom. As you can see gameplay is very much in Montezuma's mold where looting for treasure is used to give to the tribesmen to gain access to new areas. The temple is filled with traps and creatures that are intent with sending you to the grave which actually leads to one of the game's coolest moments as in the afterlife you meet Panama Joe and he ushers you back to the land of the living which is one of the best throwback cameos I've ever seen in a game. One of the most obvious drawbacks of the original version of Montezuma's was the lack of a map feature which is included in Sydney and makes exploring the hundred screen maze much easier to comprehend. There's all manner of traps from spark pits, lava, quicksand, bats, snakes etc. Although as a game Sydney is much easier and more forgiving to play with your character having nice big jumps that don't require painful pinpoint accuracy. I really also love the graphic style as it employs the C64's underused high res mode for really sharp and defined graphics and animation. The music is provided by Icon 64's regular Sid Master Soul Cross and is very reminiscent of his later tunes for them and is good without being overbearing. This is another one of those games that I stumbled across in about 2018 and literally reignited my love for the C64 once again and inevitably spawned this channel. So what more can I really say about this other than it's a C64 game well worth tracking down to play. Number 20 now let's take a look at Supremacy, the 30th anniversary edition which was released in November 2021 on the C64. This new version of the excellent Commodore 64 port has been lovingly updated and enhanced by the Cracking Group Access to celebrate the game's 30th anniversary. There truly was an epic amount of time and effort gone into this project and I was lucky enough to speak with Mike Robertson aka Knight Rider of the group and he'll be giving us a behind the scenes play by play of the entire update. And I'll now let him introduce himself. My name is Mike Robertson, also known as Knight Rider from the German working group Excess. I have been a member since 2017. I was recruited as a sort of newly active senior in 2017. Historically I started on the Commodore 64 probably around 1983, 1984 when I was at school. 1988 I would say I uh, I upgraded to an Amiga and totally forgot about the C64. And then I, I remembered when I was uh, sort of a teenager, I I, I liked to, to, to dabble on the, the sort of cracking scene and try to relearn what I'd long, long forgotten. I made some trainers just for myself and uh, uploaded them to CSDB. And then uh, obviously the other crackers in the uh, in the current scene took an interest. One of the things which they uh, encouraged me to do, which obviously no one else was doing at the time, was to uh, look at Easy Flash releases. Easy Flash is, uh, gives you about one megabyte of, of additional memory, more or less, for the Commodore 64. The loading times are significantly faster. For people who are very, very impatient like me, it's a, a great improvement. My introduction to Supremacy was actually through a bootleg version I got in 1991, which I got directly from the group Hotline, who did one of the many cracks of this game. My next door neighbor and myself played this game a lot. Despite not having the instructions, we were able to figure it out and sunk endless hours into it. I asked Mike what ultimately made them decide to update Supremacy. During the, the, the COVID lockdown, we were all at home. Uh, there was no way for us to meet. Anyway, we all geographically live relatively far away from each other, so we would have uh, maybe one time a month or one time every six weeks, we would have a, a virtual pub meeting. And uh, during the pub meeting, that's when uh, Alex, also known as Retro Luzza, uh, came up with the concept Supremacy or Overlord. 
how that this was his favorite game and he would really like to see some improvements made. So besides Access's new trainer menu, which gives you the ability to select from a host of cheats if you're just no good at the game, and a pretty great helpful instruction manual as well, I asked Mark about some of the actual updates to the core of the game that the team made. Loading and saving instead of loading to disk. Uh, the, the save state is so big it took absolutely ages to load and save. But the second thing that he particularly uh, felt was missing is there was one screen where you choose the, uh, the current uh, warrior. On the Amiga version, there were different warriors that could be selected on the C64 version. It was fixed from the moment you actually choose your opponent. I uh, cracked the game from original disc. I cracked initially the, the Overlord version, NTSC version, and sort of made some presentations about uh, what potentially could be done. HAL version was, was called Supremacy and, I, and Alex kindly uh, posted me the Supremacy disc, the original, and I, I, I cracked that. I disassembled it. I uh, found out all of the pieces of, of code which were particularly interesting for me. And I said to Alex, okay, sort of what's the requirement? And then we went through and we talked in detail and he said, okay, the Amiga has a fantastic intro which is clearly missing. Uh, there are certain screens which um, could really benefit uh, from animation. It will give the, uh, the atmosphere and so on uh, a little bit more depth. So then I went together in sort of doing a, a sort of a, a proof of concept, uh, proved that yes, this could be done. The animations could be built into the uh, into the system, and that's when the two graphic artists came into play. So we have Salt. He's from Hungary, also known as, as SCSC. He uh, did all of the, the spaceships and things like this, did an absolutely fantastic job. He said to us he's never drawn a spaceship before in his life and came up with the, uh, the fantastic spaceships that we have there and the terraformer and things like that. And then uh, Domingo from uh, Spain, he's also known as Almighty God. He came up with the, uh, the animations for the soldier, he drew the weapons, he came up with some of the frames for the different walls and the levels. Um, Salt, he also did some additional work. The animation for, for, for the intro, uh, that for me was sort of a totally new world. I'd never really particularly done any animation on the C64 in terms of uh, software sprites, because that's basically what it is. There's uh, so much animation going on, you can't use uh, hardware sprites. So I came up with a sort of a proof of concept with that and it worked relatively well. The amount of work that went into this especially detail wise is pretty exceptional. Also if you happen to have a C64 mouse it's also now compatible with this device to get that game one more step closer to the Amiga Big Brother version and that new intro is particularly awesome. Which made me curious as to how long did the team actually work on this update for? We've been working on it a long long time. Uh, some of the projects came in in the meantime for example the fantastic bug fix version, the jewel version of uh, Time Soldier, which I actually did. Uh, initially, this came as a request on forum64.de. Someone said uh, the loading times are pitiful, which of course they are. Uh, can you make it as an easy flash version? Which I did very, very quickly. But however, during playtesting of the game, the game was very, very hastily put together. I had many, many bugs. And of course, when you're creating a, a jewel version, you want to, uh, to eliminate all those bugs. With Access updating so many classic games, particularly in the last decade, I was curious if they had ever reached out to the original teams or creators to see if they'd be willing to participate or get their blessing on the versions they were now creating. We actually reached out to, to David Perry, uh, the developer of the uh, Amiga version of the software. He very kindly provided us a, a zip file with many, many assets in there. One of them was even called Source. As I mentioned previously, uh, I moved from the Commodore 64 to the Amiga. In the Amiga scene, uh, I was a cracker there. It's a lot more complicated than the 6502 uh, opcodes. So I decided I don't really want to uh, relearn um, 68,000 uh, assembly language to uh, maybe get a few tips, which I can probably a lot easier, a lot faster get from the disassembly of the uh, C64 game. Uh, we also pestered like hell, drone tell. Eventually he replied to us. Eventually we convinced him that the 30 year anniversary uh, version of, of Supremacy was coming out and 
he would potentially uh, do a, a rendition of the uh, the intro music. He did actually agree, uh, but unfortunately that's all we ever heard from him again was his agreement. We sent him many, many reminders as to what the status is, asked him if we could help. We tried to persuade him with uh, videos and clips of, of, of how we were progressing. Unfortunately, that didn't work, and we had to get uh, two other SID composers or SID musicians to assist. It's overall another outstanding release, and I'd recommend it to anyone who played and loved this back in the day to check it out. I'll leave a link in the description for you to download it. I also did a video on the update of Turbo Outrun, so if you're interested in that, check that out as well. And here's Mark on his overall thoughts on the project. Excess. Our motto is more than you deserve. Uh, I often say it, uh, often with a little uh, poke of irony. Uh, I enjoy my hobby, it's great fun. It's not more than you deserve, but uh, we, we love to say it nevertheless. I'm really, really appreciating uh, any feedback that I get uh, via Facebook, via CSDB, and people uh, leave nice comments. That they really, really in enjoy playing the games, the software and so on, which uh, me and the team uh, developed together. Behind me as well is the, the XS team. Uh, we have some really good testers. Uh, all our profiles are there on CSDB. You can look us all up. I don't take credit at all for the, uh, the Supremacy release. I'm just one small cog in the machine. And the guy who did the probably the easiest part, which was the programming, that all the creative stuff was done by, by Alex Retro Luzer. It's his passion, and the, the graphics and the sound were done by, by other guys. It's a skill and a competence or not, which I simply don't, uh, don't have. And I thank them uh, very, very much. A long, hard slog. At the end of the day, it's a hobby. We all have wives, children, jobs, other things to do as well. So, yeah. So to dedicate so much energy and passion and love, it's fantastic. So, this is Knight Rider signing out. Goodbye. It's more than you deserve. So if you've never played Supremacy before, it's an excellent strategy game for the C64. In fact, it's arguably one of the best. Extremely well balanced and by this genre standards, very easy to get into and enjoy. And if you're going to play it, you might as well play this excellent version. We interrupt our program to bring you this important message. Number 19. And here it is, my number one for 2020, which is The Shadow Over Hawksmill by Archon64 and distributed by Cytronic Software, as they deliver their best game of the year in my opinion. Hawksmill is an action puzzle adventure game inspired by the works of author H.P. Lovecraft, where your character heads off to a sleepy English village, Hawksmill, to investigate the disappearance of all the townsfolk. You've been studying the Necronomicon and believe the disappearances and the book are linked. This game follows on from the excellent Rocky Memory this game with similar action puzzle and investigation stylings and is dripping in excellent atmosphere with its awesome soundtrack just driving home that sense of dread as you investigate the town it's also really big with about 60 screens to go through as you start in the town square before descending deeper and deeper underground to the heart of the story it's very well designed with simple controls and logical puzzles that make sense and quick fast action gameplay and manages to really suck you into the world as I couldn't stop playing it until I'd gone all the way. It's also got a really good intro like Archon's Isle of the Cursed Prophet which really sets the mood and story up well and is a graphic delight as is the game which was coded by Stuart Collier of Sizzler and Legend of Atlantis fame. 
Trevor Story on graphics and design, and obviously Soul Cross with another great soundtrack that gels with the game so well. It also features one of those cool Archon 64 music demos where you can check out some music from some of their previous games as a bonus. The game is NTSC and PAL compatible and available in digital and physical form from Sartronic Software. And this is just a game I would not hesitate recommending to any C64 gamer as it's not only a great game for veterans, but also an easy game to get into for newbies to the C64 scene. Well done Icon64 and Sartronic Software for producing my personal favorite C64 game of 2020. Number 18. Steel Ranger was released in 2018 by Cytronic Software and is another game by Lasse Oni whose previous title, Hessian, is another gem that will be covered on this channel at some point. Just like in the case of Manfred Trends, although this time it is completely programmed by one man himself, including the music, and is a real feat if you have to consider the quality and size of it. Just like Turrican, Steel Ranger is a run and gun platform exploration game, although there is a much bigger emphasis on story with light RPG elements, as well as you can upgrade your suit and weaponry. The story is humanity has left Earth and is attempting to find another planet to colonize, but run into this machine race bent on human extinction. That's where you come in as your ship is sent to investigate a planet and crashes, resulting in the start of your adventure. The action is a lot less hectic than Turrican, with the exploration aspect much more prevalent, tons of weapons and suit upgrades like being able to transform into the ball like Turrican and the ability to get jetpacks later on all add massive layers to an already dense gaming experience. There are no levels and the entire game is made up of six massive sections you can explore by unlocking certain areas to progress. Finding secret rooms, tons of variations on enemies to destroy, never mind all the epic boss encounters make this really stand out as a top quality C64 title on all levels. Levels. Graphics and music are quite excellent and it plays extremely well with its mixture of exploration and run and gun action. This game is also NTSC and PAL compatible and works perfectly on a C64 Mini as well. So head on over to Cytronic and check it out for yourself. Number 17 Lester was released on the Commodore 64 in January 2023 and is the first big game of the year for the old breadbox. Put together by Knife Grinder, who did design, code, graphics and sound, which is very impressive. What's even more crazy though is that this is his first C64 game, which is an amazing feat. Lester itself is an action platform Metroidvania style game with tons of action, platforming, collecting and a huge space station to explore. The story goes the main computer AR of a space station orbiting Mars goes rogue and is now steering the station which is filled with radioactive material right for Earth. You're an android on board and the only one that's able to stop it. The game takes its inspiration from a modern 2017 MSX game called Ghost or Mini Ghost and you can definitely see the similar stylings although this is not a conversion of that game. Overall it feels like an NES game when played just with way better music of course. As you search the station you can pick up key cards that give you access to new areas. You can upgrade your weapon at a computer terminal and access the station's map to figure out where to go next. As you search the station you can blast all enemies and barrels to collect coins which can be used to upgrade your weapons and regain your health. The station is packed with enemy robots, turrets, radioactive pools, sparks and so much more. It's a deceptively simple game at first that as it opens up becomes more and more tricky. Special weapons and items can also be picked up like shields, a screen destroying bomb and a laser blast that can shoot through walls with items that include a wallet that can double your coin pickups, infrared goggles to see in the dark and many more. It also employs a light RPG mechanic. With every drone killed you gain one experience point and once the bar maxes out you get rewarded with more health. Your ultimate goal here is to regain control of the station and thus stop it from crashing into earth. This is such a well made and simple to play game with spot on controls that are very responsive and work perfectly with the one button gameplay. The graphics are very detailed and colorful with nice animation and a great attention to detail. And like I said earlier the music is super cool with tons of excellent 
fast-paced SID tracks to keep the action going, plus an impressive little intro and outro sequence. The game is both PAL and NTSC compatible, although from what I understand, the PAL speed is what it's meant to be played at. It's also both mini and maxi compatible, as well as real hardware. And even though it has over 60 plus rooms to explore, it shouldn't take you too long to complete, and that's perfectly fine by me, because the story and environments are such a lot of fun to explore. The game is also available for free or name your own price, with obviously links in the video description to check it out. So why not give the dev a few bucks and enjoy a new, wonderfully made Metroidvania style game on the old bread box. Number 16. MW Ultra or Metal Warrior Ultra by Cytronic Software is a side-scrolling action-adventure game distributed by Protovision in 2020. It is part of the Metal Warrior series that started on the C64 in 1999 with its first release as it was originally an Amiga game from 1994. But this game is a massive overhaul or update of that original C64 version. The story is your friend dies on an illegal job that you're trying to pull off which leads to a local metal band as well as your own cracked psyche as you try to solve all the conspiracies surrounding it. The game was made by Lasse Arne who made the excellent Steel Ranger and Hessian. The game features a massive futuristic open world to explore, full of puzzles and people to talk to, cinematic cutscenes, massive bosses, a huge assortment of weapons to buy, built-in save game slots, excellent music and sound effects, awesome graphics and animation, and top-notch gameplay to make it quite a remarkable game. It took two years to put together with a completely new engine and is a huge upgrade from the original version in every sense, almost to the point that it's a completely new game. If you got a chance to play Steel Ranger then you know the kind of coolness that Lasse can deliver and this does that in spades. The game is available from Protovision in physical and digital versions. It's a high quality action adventure game that mixes the best of the genre with some really excellent storytelling. It's just a must play game of 20 20. Number 15. So you would think that with over 20 different versions of this game existing, a Commodore 64 port would have happened. But no, it didn't. It took 22 years and an unofficial port for it finally to appear on the C64 in 2011. And boy was it worth the wait. The port was headed up by Andreas Varga, better known in the C64 community as Mr. Sid. He went back to the original Apple II source code to produce this fantastic version, which makes it very accurate to the original game. Besides programming, graphics and sound, Andreas also had help with graphics by Stephen Day, who also worked on the X excellent unofficial Donkey Kong Jr. conversion to the C64, which I covered in episode 6 of this show. Graphically this game captures the look of the PC version very well and all the animation and cutscenes are intact, and it has an excellent rendition of the PC music and good sound effects. It's quite an amazing feat, not only that, but all 13 levels are present, making it a 100% accurate port in terms of keeping all features and levels intact. It's still a damn tough game, but plays really well, with live slow down in certain sections, but apart from that it's pretty brilliant. You can play it through emulation on BOSS or a C64 Mini, and the game is made possible to run on an original C64 as well as an Easy Flash cartridge, which holds more memory than a standard C64 allowing the game to run perfectly on the system. This is another excellent effort by Mr. Sid and crew, and still proves the old Bray box has a lot of life still left in it, and we wouldn't have it any other way. Number 14 and here it is, La Bie de More, my favorite C64 game of 2019. And it's another game by Antonio Savona and Sol Cross, the guys responsible for those excellent C64 Activision conversions. This game just oozes quality from start to finish. It's not extremely long, but it's jammed with detail, which is something I prefer to an overlong slog just for the sake of making a longer game. In this excellent platform adventure game, you play a monk on the run from the Templars, who ends up at this haunted church. Gameplay is very similar to the classic Monty on the Run game, where you collect scrolls revealing more about the story as you try to find all the crosses in the church. With its high res graphics and excellent haunting music from Soul Cross, it's a wonderful game that is really fun to play. And it's not super difficult either, but challenging enough to keep you coming back to see the entire game through. Double Sided Games also has a full physical release for this one, so the option to get that awesome edition is still available. This is a highly recommended game from me that all C64 64 owners should give a try. It's just pure excellent stuff. 
Number 13. Bruce Lee Return of Fury is the second fan-made Bruce Lee C64 game to be made and was released by Megastyle in 2019. Story-wise, this one is a direct sequel to the first, where the original wizard dude has rebuilt his castle and Bruce can't help but challenge him, as in the movie Game of Death. Yama and the Ninja make their return, and now all three can be human controlled with ProDivision's 4-player adapter, making this the ultimate Bruce Lee multiplayer experience. Gameplay-wise, because coder DMX, who did the sequel, used the original source code, this game feels exactly like the original with all its quirks intact and makes it feel a little bit more authentic than the previous game. Collecting lanterns, avoiding traps all make a return and the new screens are well implemented with really great well thought out level designs. Difficulty is probably on par with the original, meaning it's quite easy but a real fun experience. Graphics and sound are pretty much a carbon copy of the original, with the inclusion of an excellent title screen and brilliant load of music by Anders Rodal, who did the awesome load of music in Megastyle's Exploding Fish. I had so much fun with this new release and would highly recommend it to any classic fan of the original, and I think it stands alone as a really great game for newbies to the C64 as well. Number 12. Nostalgia did it again with this 2015 redo of the elite original Commodore 64 version, dubbed the Ghosts and Goblins Arcade. Just like their redo of Commando, the attention to detail is amazing, from the new title screen which adds all the missing details from the arcade back, graphical enhancements on every level, all 8 arcade levels are now included, new music for every stage, and the original arcade intro has been recreated. And with Nostalgia being a cracking group, you now have a full page of cheats to activate before playing, which with this game you may actually need. <laughs> I really love that they included many of the monsters and bosses missing from the original, and it makes the game way harder, but it also makes the game feel complete and for that I applaud them. Here yeah, I was hoping that they'll tackle Elite's mediocre 1942 conversion next and maybe give it the conversion it actually deserved. Overall though, Nostalgia did an amazing job on the graphics and adding new music to each level is really nice. Even though the tracks aren't as memorable as Mark's Cooksey's original theme, there is a lot of them and the variation is really appreciated. Check out Ghosts and Goblins Arcade on your C64 or your C64 Mini. It's another 8-bit gem that is begging for a playthrough. Number 11. SNK vs Capcom was released on the Commodore 64 at the end of September 2023. An unofficial conversion of the Neo Geo Pocket game, SNK vs Capcom Match of the Millennium. This game is right up my alley. 90s fighting games is one of my favorite periods of gaming, and combining that with the C64, my favorite computer of all time, is pure gold. I bought a Neo Geo Pocket Color in the late 90s based solely on the SNK vs Capcom, King of the Fighters R2, and so many other fighting games. It was the first time I actually played a handheld fighting game that I felt was actually just as good as an arcade or console fighters. This conversion has been several years in development, at this point by two guys, John Eggleton and Gianluca Alberico and they truly did a marvelous job on this title. One on one versus games is not the C64 strong suit, only a handful out of its entire library are actually any good, and I'm a massive fan of the system so that's just an honest opinion. Well we can add this one now to that small list of excellent versus gems. If you're not familiar with the series it's basically two companies, Capcom and SNK, the biggest versus fighting companies at that time, coming together to pit some of their best characters against each other. I played the Dreamcast version of this game like a madman and pitting Street Fighter, Fatal Fury, King of the Fighters and even Darkstalker characters against each other was a fighting gamer's dream come true and it delivered big time. The C64 version is a loose port of the Neo Geo Pocket version. It keeps the style, look and charm but also feels like its own individual game so it's more like a remix or even an update. This game goes all out. You now have a whopping 16 characters to choose from, three more than the the original Neo Geo Pocket version, every one of them keeping that excellent two color style and brilliant animation of the portable original. So many classic SNK and Capcom backgrounds have been recreated and I love the attention to detail with the small animations in the background to liven things up. The game gives you three play styles, story mode, versus and tournament, each delivering something different and cool. Story features each character's own story mode with rivals, dialogue before and after matches and is like a full arcade experience. Versus is just you against a friend in two player competitive action and tournament is just awesome where you get to pick a massive roster of characters and have a full on tournament mode with friends who can swap to 
joysticks and take turns or just play by yourself and is a great way to learn the ins and outs of the game if you want to practice. The real question here though is how does it play? The simplest answer is excellently. Just like the pocket version all the moves are boiled down to two buttons. The C64 version gives you the option of playing as a one button or two button game. Both work extremely well but I'd still recommend two if you can and you definitely want to use some sort of gamepad through emulation or on your real 64 because a regular Commodore 64 controller just doesn't cut it especially if you want to play this using all the moves and specials. This whole game is just a love letter to fighting games. There are so many more positives such as the excellent SID interpretations of the music for every stage, three different bonus rounds, extra moves and the cool super moves from the Alpha series is all in here making all this the icing on the cake. Best of all of course is the game is free for you to download and to play on real hardware, the mini maxi or just through emulation and is an amazing piece of work by two guys that really put their passion and talents to work on this excellent game. Well done. We interrupt our program to bring you this important message. And we'll stop this list one final time for the last of my honorable mentions. Night Night is a fun 2021 port of an MSX game and combines platforming and screen coloring like something out of an old early 80s arcade game. New Rally X64 is an unofficial conversion of Namco's arcade from 1980 and is a very nice addition to the C64 arcade library. Nixie the Glade Sprite is a very good 2021 Citronic release that combines action, platforming, puzzles and exploration with a lovely graphic style and music. Run Demon Run is a cool 2019 arcade 64 game in the endless runner mold with slick production values and super cool music. Katabatia is an interesting little 2020 roguelike RPG hybrid with simple graphics but tons of atmosphere and addictiveness. Sizzler is a 2018 Archon 64 production that mixes arcade platforming and exploration with impressive visuals but with a very hard difficulty. Mark Mech is a fun platformer collect em up game from LC Games from 2022 and is a great ode to old style arcade games. Bare Essentials is a lip screen action platformer from Graham Axton and is a wonderfully addictive game with a great graphic style. Dr. Maria is a pretty cool 2023 Tetris style game and an homage to the NES classic Dr. Mario. Manic Mana 64 DX is another Graham Axton game from 2019 and is an updated version of the classic Manic Mana with lots of bug fixes and updates. Pio Snake is a very cool 2015 game from Antonia Savona and plays like the old arcade game Snake but with a very unique control style and lovely high res graphics and awesome music. And lastly is a guy named Nick Sherman of Arlasoft. He's been slaving away porting Atari 2600 games and classic arcade games to the C64 for many years now at a pretty relentless pace with too many games to possibly mention. Just check out my unconverted series for many of his cool creations. And now the heavy hitters, my top 10 favorites. <laughs> Riley Witch Chronicles was released in the last quarter of 2021 by Witchsoft on the Commodore 64. This game is a full-on traditional JRPG on the C64 programmed, written and designed by Sarah Jane Avery of Soul Force fame. It's a big fun adventure clocking in at between 15 and 30 hours depending on your skill level so there's plenty of bang for your buck here. The game itself is based on Sarah's own Briley Witch Chronicles book series and if you like old school traditional 80s style JRPGs like the original Final Fantasy and Dragon Quest, then this game is going to be right up your alley. The story involves Briley, a girl from Earth who gets sucked into another world of witches and magic. There she has to adapt quickly and learn the witching ways to basically survive and solve the mystery of the dark spirit who resides in the forest. This game covers the first four books in Sarah's series, with her saying herself, yes there will be a Briley 2 and a Briley 3, thinking of making an Amiga versions of the whole series too. So the series is probably 
probably going to see the entire book series in game form, which is quite amazing. The game itself is pure quality from top to bottom. Gameplay is slow but rewarding, with lots of turn-based combat and chatting with NPCs, and obviously completing quests. The menus are layered with details, from equipping items, mixing ingredients to make potions, exploring vast dungeons in towns. The best part of Bali for me is the writing though, and how it actually manages to make every character unique and memorable, which is quite a feat for 8-bit gaming. If you're not good at RPGs, then fear not as well, as it has the option to play a normal or easy mode if you just want to follow the story and enjoy the overall experience. Music is also quite good. I did notice that some of the tracks are almost slowed down versions of some of the music from Soul Force, or at least that's what it sounds like to me. Still, awesome stuff nevertheless. I also love the easy to use save feature and the fact that you can actually play this keyboard style, which for me makes this game's pace and menu so much quicker and easier to navigate, and I'd highly recommend this over the joystick controls. It also features an excellent PDF manual which is loaded with information, and I'd definitely recommend you read this before starting up the game. It's both NTSC and PAL compatible, and works on the Mini and Maxi. This game is just plain excellent, great varied graphics, nice soundtrack, deep gameplay, great writing and solid game mechanics across the board. Just make it my personal favorite C64 game of 2021. Check it out. I'm sure you won't be disappointed. Number nine. Sonic the Hedgehog was released in 2021 on the Commodore 64, a full 30 years after its original debut. This is of course an unofficial version, although I think Yuzo Koshiro and original creator Yuji Naka would be impressed at what's been accomplished here. This remake of the 8-bit Master System version was done by Mr. Sid, the C64 Master Coder. behind the excellent Prince of Persia and Donkey Kong Jr. ports to the C64 over the last decade. Please check out my videos on both of these for more details. So all the gameplay and story elements are intact and the same. So let's look on over at the graphics and sound. The look of this game is just plain gorgeous for a C64 game, really capturing the feel of the Master System version, but still looking like a C64 game in the end. I really like the color choices used in Sonic. The various shades of blue make them look really detailed and the backdrops are replicated extremely well with a massive amount of variety from level to level. It features all six Master System levels with the Green Hill Zone, Bridge Zone, Jungle Zone, Labyrinth Zone, Scrap Brain Zone, and lastly Scarbase Zone plus the excellent pinball style bonus stage. The Sid music tracks by Mikhail Hastrap are great versions of the originals and again manage to still sound and feel like C64 tracks which I really love. Like the Master System version it's a bit slower than the 16-bit one, focusing more on tricky level design and light exploration to compensate and it still works really well despite a bit of slowdown here and there which the Master System version also has. It still runs really well and the scrolling is extremely smooth. Just due to the stages being a bit smaller, the game is easier to complete than the 16-bit Big Brother, although that damn underwater stage still overstays its welcome, but you could say that about almost any video game. I'm looking at you, Tomb Raider. I love this, I still can't believe I'm playing Sonic on the C64. It literally combines my two favorite things in gaming, the Commodore 64 and Sega into one glorious package. It's so well made, and despite being able to complete it fairly quickly, you still got the task of doing it while collecting all the Chaos Emeralds for the proper ending, which is a pretty tough but doable task. This team has given us another classic right up there with the Super Mario Commodore 64 conversion. And if you want to play this on the original C64, for hardware, you are going to need an REU or RAM expansion unit, as the game needs that to run, or an Ultimate 2 cartridge will do the trick. It's also playable through VAS once you set the RAM expansion option, or on a C64 Mini and Maxi as long as you use a D81 file. I'll leave a link to the download in the description, which has the D64 and D81 downloads for whatever you need. Knights of Bites is a C64 publisher founded in 1997 by Chester Colston and made some other great fun C64 games like Ice Guys and Bomb Mania in the late 90s. Metal Dust is an amazing horizontal shoot 'em up that has to be seen to be believed. I'll talk about how this game is possible on the C64 later, but let's first focus on the game itself. At first glance it's your standard shoot 'em up fair and doesn't really add anything new to the genre, but the technical aspect of it though is thoroughly amazing. 
building. There are only four levels, which doesn't sound like much, but they are pretty massive in length and feature tons of mini bosses before the big end of the level encounters. If you're a veteran Commodore 64 user, you will no doubt notice that these guys were probably big fans of programmer Manfred Trends, who did Catechus, R-Type, and Enforcer on the C64. The style of the graphics and the insane pace of the game reminds me so much of those classic games. Every level feels like an epic journey as it progresses and you feel like you're heading further and further down that rabbit hole. As per usual, the game features tons of power-ups and the classic charge shot just like in our top. The music is absolutely amazing as the game streams full digi music that just sounds fantastic and every track is a treat. In order to play this beast on a real C64, you're gonna need a super CPU with a RAM card with at least 4 meg of RAM. All this extra memory and features allows this game's music and insane graphics to exist. If that's unavailable to you, you can still play it in VAS, as it supports the Super CPU through emulation. And I suggest you check out Reset64 Fanzine issue number 11, as it gives you a full step-by-step -step process on how to get this game running. And it was the only way I was able to finally play this game once and for all. Overall, as a C64 shoot'em up, it's one of the best. The fast pace and relentless action, really well-designed stages and boss battles, and the fantastic graphics and sound design really shows what the C64 is capable of with just a little bit of a boost. Galencia was programmed by Jason Aldred and released for the Commodore 64 through Protovision Games in 2017. Attention to detail is in high order, from the cool loading Sid music to the fun intro sequence that really sets the tone for this exceptionally well made game. The story is cheesy bee movie fun where we let the bee population of Earth almost completely die out and now the bee space guardians are here to attack Earth. Your character also gets to pilot the 1981 Galencia ship, which is an obvious reference to Galencia itself and its release date, and have to blast all the bugs and defend Earth from the bee domination. What I really like about this game, and you're probably going to hear me say this in the future episodes of the series, but although the game is retro in lock and the system it's on, it still manages to feel like a modern game. The ship feels very smooth, the fire rate is a bit faster than Gallagher, so you get to feel a lot more lethal and it pumps up the fun factor as the pace feels much quicker through the 50 levels a sucker has to offer. There are also two types of bonus stages, one being the traditional shoot the swarms without missing a shot kind of deal, just like Gallagher, but the second one has you flying through an asteroid belt, just trying to survive all the while trying to pick up these strange stars which boost your score and in turn get you closer to those free lives. The music and sound effects are top notch as well and we have Pulsebot and Soul Cross to thank for that. The graphics are really nice too, detailed, colourful and you can see a lot of effort has gone into the smallest of details. And don't just take my word for it, even Julian Regnall from Zap64 gave it a sizzler so you know this thing is legit. This is just a fantastic game whether you play the awesome physical version from Proto on a real C64, there's both NTSC and PAL versions available by the way, or download it and play it through your VAS emulator, you're in for a damn good time. Night and Grail was released in 2009 by Cytronic Software and developed by Wide Pixel Games. When I finally had space to unpack my C64 and jump back into Commodore games in 2017, just before starting this channel, Night and Grail was the first game I came across when I did a search to see if anyone had been making new C64 games. To my surprise, hundreds of them had been made and many of them published in physical form as well. I immediately ordered this physical version. You see here, the C64 had again hooked me. Grail is a big metroidvania action adventure game that brings all the best elements of this genre into a stunning package. As you can see from this map, the game is pretty big, featuring over 200 rooms to explore and puzzles to solve. The basic gameplay has you searching the castle for weapons and armor, each variation giving you new abilities to help you reach different parts of the castle or defeat certain creatures or bosses way more effectively. The goal is to find the Grail, which is said can lift the curse put on the knight and his girlfriend turning her into to a dragon. Like any good Castlevania game, Grail slowly unfolds, giving upgrades at a steady pace, always giving you more new areas to explore and things to do as you search the castle. You have a handy map at your disposal and are able to switch your weapons and armor out at any time to take advantage of all situations. This game has great atmospheric sound effects and music and lush graphics with really well designed rooms and puzzles, which makes Night and Grail one of the best games of this genre on the old C64 and an 
absolute must-play game. Lucia The Lost Island is a joint release between Cytronic Software and Protovision. This was my most unexpected C64 game of the year that just delivered on everything I could have possibly wanted in a game of this genre, which is a Zelda styled adventure puzzle game, which is pretty uncommon on the C64 which makes this an extra special treat. You play Nora who is about to celebrate her 16th birthday in her small village, but a bunch of big events are about to be set in motion and Nora is going to be thrown into a situation where she's gonna have to save the world. The story, characters and settings are the real charm of this game. Much like 2021's Briley Witch Chronicles, the interaction and the more time you put into this game, the more rewarding it becomes. The game is absolutely huge as well, as you can see by this awesome map, taking place over two islands with over 40 plus characters to talk to, interact and get quests from. What I like about this game is the modern sensibilities added into the gameplay. Simple menu system with easy to use items, quests that are logical, a hint system if you get stuck, etc etc. Made for you. The game was put together by the group Pulsar and is a piece of work that is clearly a labor of love. Coded by Stefan Maida with music by Marcus Jentsch, which is the best C64 soundtrack of the year, hands down. It complements the game beautifully, with tracks switching in and out all the time based on different situations and environments. It's brilliant. The graphics have their own unique style, chunky but beautifully colored and varied, even with its own day-night cycle. There is also a very cool prologue game to this story called Nathan's Journey, which you can play before this to introduce you to the world. This game is available in digital form with the prologue and works on both real hardware and the Mini and Maxi, and physical versions are both available from Cytron and Protovision in different forms so check them both out. This is a beautiful well thought out game that will provide you with hours of entertainment and is something quite unique on the old bread box. Download it now, you will not regret it. Eye of the Beholder was released on the Commodore 64 at the end of 2022 and was a game I was highly anticipating to play but due to the C64 onslaught of releases and the time needed to get into this I just had to put it aside until now when I finally played it. Thank goodness it really lived up to all my expectations. This unofficial port of the DOS original was done by Andreas Larson and his team of Oliver Lindau on the graphics intro and more. He also worked on the excellent Sonic port we looked at on episode 2 and the team of Lesch, Mirage and Two Follower on the sublimely detailed in-game graphics, plus the always reliable Linus giving the Sid interpretations of some classic tunes. The game has been in development for many years and it's so nice to see it finally released. Gameplay is exactly the same as the PC counterpart. All the real-time action, dungeon exploring and light puzzle solving is all intact. Nothing has been lost or discarded in this port. In fact, it's got even more options with the team's excellent implementation of an auto map feature, which you can switch to at any time, so no more need for pen and paper. And this truly makes this game way more accessible. If you have a real Commodore 128 system, you get even more, with being able to hook up to a dual screen setup to have the map on one screen and the game on the other, plus support for the 2 MHz mode to speed things up. Having said that though, the C64 version is pretty fast and responsive and plays well on a real system, although you're gonna need a 1351 mouse to play it realistically. If you don't simply play it in VAS with a PC mouse, it works exceptionally well. If you've never played it before, it's 90% mouse driven with just a few simple keyboard strokes for map, bestiary and a help screen, so it's not too complicated at all. The game is pretty difficult though, especially in the beginning, so you better save it often. If you've never played the original, I'd highly suggest checking out a portion of a long play just to get the gist to help you understand the mechanics. Don't be overwhelmed. Take your time. It's a game that really deserves to be explored fully. Graphically it's just beautiful. Sometimes I even feel like I'm playing the Amiga version. It's that impressive. With its attention to detail and a lot of thought and planning has gone into its control scheme, which isn't a natural fit for the C64, but the team make it work very well overall. This is another landmark title for the C64 and is, without a doubt, the new benchmark for dungeon crawlers on the system. I'll leave a link to the developer's website as it contains lots of useful information on how to set up and play this game on all C64 related systems and emulation. I tested it on a real C64 with my Kung Fu Flash cartridge and it worked great. 
but I don't have a mouse as I said earlier so I was very limited as to what I could do. The C64 Maxi also works really well. The Mini is a no-go I'm afraid but vast emulation was the best for me for this game. So download it, it's free and enjoy one of the greatest dungeon crawlers ever now on your humble C64. 2017 was an excellent year for C64 releases, but I don't think anyone could have predicted that Sam's Journey would be such a powerhouse of a platform release, rivaling the almost untouchable Mayhem in Monsterland for the C64 platforming crown. Sam's Journey was released through Protovision and created by the guys at Knights of Bats, whose past projects, Asgars and Metal Dust, were both released through Protovision on the C64 as well. Knights of Bats were formed in the 90s by Chester Colson, where they released a bunch of late 90s to mid 2000s C64 releases. Their last Commodore game was Metal Dust in 2005 before they moved on to modern systems under a different name. In 2015 however, Chester revived the old label and production of Sam's Journey began. Just seeing that colourful, vibrant title screen, you know you're in for a top quality production. The game is made up of 27 levels with multiple overhead maps as well, giving you that almost Super Mario World vibe. This game, like Monster Land, just grabs you right from the start with its beautiful colourful sprite based graphics and smooth scrolling effects, and the music is fun and jolly in the best sense. As per usual with these games, collecting diamonds, finding secrets, jumping or just plain avoiding platform related death is all part of the fun. The game also employs the costume mechanic. It's not new and has been done many times before like Sega's Kid Chameleon, but it does it very well and each of the six costumes bestows a new skill for Sam. Some of them like the pirate costume gives you a sword for dispatching enemies, or the ninja costume gives you the ability to jump up to impossible to reach areas, or the Dracula costume turning you into a bat. It's all extremely fun and adds so much replayability to each area. You're gonna die a lot. But I like the fact that the game starts you almost where you died, so it's never this long, tedious sequence of redoing half a level again. It's a great modern touch in a retro game. It's also C64 Mini compatible, and the jump is already mapped to the fire button for the system, making it very easy for younger players to get into it who aren't used to pushing up to jump. Overall though, Sam's Journey is a massive, beautiful game, and injects so much life into the C64 it almost feels like I'm playing it on a new system. Soul Force was released by Protovision on the last day of 2020. It's the third game in a trilogy of shoot 'em ups that programmer Sarah Jane Avery has delivered to the C64 in the last two years. Unlike her other two entries, which were vertically scrolling affairs, this is a horizontal entry with enough blasting action to make Manford trends blush. The story of the game is your part of the galaxy is getting invaded by a biomechanical invasion force, and it's up to you and the Soul Force space fighter to destroy the threat once and for all. Just like Sarah's other other two brilliant shooters, this C64 gem is loaded with modern gaming features which feels like a nice fit on the C64. We got plenty of options like four different difficulty settings, a password system to access levels that you've completed, and a built-in save game system, an auto fire option, and the game works on NTSC and PAL systems. But my favorite of all the options is being able to listen to any of the game's music tracks, which is a cool console style feature. Now onto the game itself which includes 20 massive stages jam-packed with space, underwater, forests and alien bases, and tons of crazy bosses and mid-bosses to defeat. The levels are jam-packed with parallax scrolling, and the stages get more and more crazy the further you go. I love the inclusion of the intermission screens between levels, it adds a lot of atmosphere, and the story elements between you and the main commander. It's this kind of fun stuff that makes this game stand above the rest. And what's a shooter like this without some great weapons? There are four types of pickups, and you can upgrade those to make them way more powerful. Lasers, triple shots, as well as click bombs to blow up everything on screen. Also like Sarah's excellent recent Zeta Wing game, if you die you only lose one level of your weapon power, so none of that annoying you lose everything effect that so many of these games on the C64 employed. You can also pick up a shield that can take a good number of hits, and this makes the game way more accessible to people that are not skilled in this genre. I had an absolute blast playing this game. I feel it just gets better and better the further you get. The later levels literally throw everything at you and it's a real rush and has a classic feel of a really good retro arcade game. The graphics are very good, the parallax scrolling on some of the stages are just excellent and the sheer
sheer variety of enemies and bosses is absolutely crazy. I love the small graphical touches like the jellyfish that split into two small versions when shot, or the massive missiles that when hit drop to the surface and explode. The music is also fantastic. The amount of tracks packed in here is amazing. The best part is the overall Soul Force theme is carried over into a lot of the tracks, which makes it feel like a really good classic movie soundtrack, which tars all the music together. And I really love all those fast paced boss tracks. There's some real toe tappers in there. The game is available in both physical cartridge version and digital form. And if you got a digital copy and want to pimp it out, check out the Cracking Group Access's new tool to convert your version into a crazy trained version, with every cheat imaginable to help you if you're still finding the game too hard. I'll leave a link in the description to the Protovision website and this tool. This game is a brilliant shoot 'em up, jam packed with content, and is truly a huge game with some of the best vertical scrolling action the C64 has to offer, and stands tall with Sarah's Neutron and Zeta Wing as another classic addition to the C64's shoot 'em up library. And the last quick stop here. It was extremely difficult obviously to pick my personal favorite game of the last two decades, but for me this has to be the number one. A Pig's Quest was released in February of 2023 by Piggy18 Team on the Commodore 64. This game has been in development for many years now and is probably one of the most anticipated C64 releases of the year, with the team sticking to their when it's ready it's ready philosophy when approaching the making of this game. So before we start diving into this platform adventure gem, I'll let Coda of the game Antonio Savona introduce himself and the rest of the team behind this game. The team behind the Pig Quest is made of uh, Alan Morissette, who did all the graphics and came up with the original idea for the game. So in a way you can say he was the driving force of the project. And then we have uh, Aldo Chiummo and Gaetano Chiummo, uh, who did the music and sound effects. And then there's me, uh, did all the coding, uh, which mostly consists of being impressed by the quality of what the team delivered and trying to do it justice. Over the years Antonio has worked on a host of exceptional Commodore games, including my choice for C64 Game of the Year in 2019, La de More, as well as Planet Golf, Monstro Giganto, Boxy Moxie and so many others. So check out his C64 back catalogue, you won't be disappointed. And now let's check out the story of the game, which puts you in the role of Frank Further, a pig from the village of Porkville. There are four statues of wellness, kind of like the Shankara stones from the Temple of Doom, and they were stolen sending the village into a state of discontent and numbness. Frank one day stumbles upon a mysterious cave close to his village and thus kickstarts his adventure or his pig's quest. The backstory is all illustrated wonderfully by graphics artist Morissette in the game's beautiful manual, which will be included in the digital version as a PDF and in its original physical form for the game's boxed release. I then asked Antonio how long the project has actually been in development for till this point. Almost three years, and that's a long time, but it's also the largest game we've ever worked on. Of course it wasn't three years of just doing that because we developed a big quest in our spare time as it's the case with every Commodore 64 game uh, but still it was a challenging project. All through the development uh, our motto was ready when it's ready. We really wanted to deliver something special and we didn't want to take any shortcut. Uh, now it's not for me to say whether the game is good or bad, ultimately the gamers will tell, but what I can say is that this is the best that we're capable of. So we wanted to do the best game we could with the best graphics, the best music that we could deliver. So we didn't cut any corner in the process. As you can no doubt tell, the game can be best described as a platform action adventure game, which invokes strong vibes of Capcom's Ghosts and Goblins arcade, but it's way more than that on so many levels. Each of the massive five stages offer their own set of challenges in terms of action and puzzles. You can pick up a variety of weapons from treasure chests scattered throughout the lands, although you'll need keys to open them, which are placed all about to find. Some are hidden well and requiring lots of exploration to find those little secret areas. Once opened, you could receive one of four weapons, including a variety of swords and a Molnir styled hammer, each with their own strength and rate of fire. Armor is also a vital element of the game, Ghost and Goblin style 
lifestyle, with various sets to find to protect you from incoming fire. Too many hits and they'll eventually wear out, leaving you with just your health bar unprotected. The puzzles are quite fun to figure out, mostly involving throwing a switch or collecting an object to open a gate, etc, etc. But make you search the levels and pay a lot more attention to the objects to find out the tricks and are not annoying in any sort of way. There are some nice modern touches also in the menu system at the bottom of the screen, including a small energy bar of whatever enemy you currently blasting at, which is very useful when fighting those bosses, letting you know if you're actually doing some damage or not. And I also like the little text scroll which gives you Frank's thoughts and conveys story elements that way, as well as providing hints on various areas to help you along the adventure. And don't be too stressed out by that timer in the corner. I found that it was generally pretty generous for most levels. Also with the game providing three levels of difficulty in the beginning, giving everyone a fighting chance. I then asked Antonio from a programmer's perspective if he could tell us about some of the challenges in bringing this game to completion. Managing the graphics was by far the hardest challenge for me. Now in your regular 8-bit game, uh, graphics are assembled using so-called tiles, that is graphical elements that you use as tessels to compose the world. This is not only a mean to save memory, but also a way to display graphics and move objects around in a quick and efficient way, on a Commodore 64 at least. A big quest doesn't use tiles at all, so it's entirely made in bitmap mode, which allows for more colorful graphics and more variety, and basically each level is just one gigantic illustration. Therefore, the artist, so Morissette in this case, is presented with this huge canvas and is basically free to do whatever he wants with it, without the constraint of needing to reuse the same graphical elements over and over. Um, now this is all good, uh, but then moving all that graphics around on a stock Commodore 64, because we didn't want to rely on any additional hardware, uh, was a programmer's nightmare. The graphics are absolutely stunning on so many levels, with the attention to detail being astonishing, and the variety from level to level truly making it feel like a grand adventure, with the locations feeling like characters themselves. The large desert landscapes, under ground caves and structures, gorgeous weather effects, day and night settings. It's truly one of the most amazing looking C64 games out there. The variety of the enemies is also crazy, each level not simply recycling henchmen, but getting its own unique set based on that level. And I really love the little graphical ode thrown in referencing Antonio's La Bide de More Belfry sequence, which is pretty funny. One can only imagine what people would have thought of this game if it was released in 1986. Namori set is not just good with pixels, he's also a professional comic artist and he designed the manual for the game as a comic book. Uh, he also did the poster and all the illustrations for the packaging and the merchandising and so on and so forth. So really something to look forward to. Morissette has truly delivered perfection in C64 form, not only in terms of settings, but also the animation is absolutely top notch. The sound is also in a league of its own, with Aldo and Gaetano Cuomo providing not only atmospheric tunes, but a full soundtrack's worth of multiple sets per level, changing as the atmosphere progresses. It's a full on Last Ninja style experience, and not just simply two tracks alternating between levels. Now the audio aspect of the game is really something else by the way. Um, we have about 30 tunes, uh, a grand total of 90 minutes of music, uh, so these figures alone are hard to believe for a Commodore 64 game, but it's not just the amount of it, also the quality, they really compose an incredible soundtrack, so wait until you listen to it. Overall a pig's quest is stunning, its gameplay is tight, responsive and pitch perfect, the levels of difficulty making it appealing to both newbies and veterans alike, the setting, graphics and overall atmosphere make it stand shoulders above many C64 games of recent years. And let me just say that the recent years have been very very good, so that's saying something. I asked Antonio what's still the appeal of programming on an over 40 year old computer at this point. Well the appeal comes from the challenge itself. To me as a programmer uh, I know that there are very specific boundaries that someone has set on the Commodore 64 in the past 40 years and um, you can try to break these boundaries and you can try to do something new. And this is just not possible on a modern platform because uh, with your proper resources you can do pretty much anything. So what is the fun? The game is playable on a real C64, the Mini, the Maxi and Vice and is both NTSC and PAL compatible. Although Antonio says it was designed in PAL format, so if you're playing on an emulator device I'd suggest using PAL settings for optimal performance as they were intended to run. The game will be released on the 14th of February, there will be a digital download version available on uh, itch.io 
and then a boxed version sold by Protovision. And check out my video description with all the links to both the digital version from Itch and the physical version from Protovision and enjoy a truly remarkable game on the Commodore 64. And that's it. I hope you enjoyed the list. The amount of quality Commodore 64 games that have been released in the last 20 or so years is truly astounding. Bear in mind, this list is just a very small fraction of the amount of games that have been released. What's really important here is what's your number one. That's all that really matters. You can think of this video as a guide. If you're looking for modern C64 games, then you've got a whole list here to check out. And thanks for joining me, Bastish B, for 64K. I hope you had a good time. And if you can, please like and subscribe. That'll be greatly appreciated. And I'll see you next time. Cheers. Mm -hmm.